thank you for joining us. I am Victoria Newland, the new CEO of the Center for a New American Security. This afternoon, as all of you know, is the first public event and report of the CNAS multi-year initiative on the evolving force of the future. And today we're releasing our first report in this category. I hope you've all seen it. I hope you've grabbed copies. Uh, called Building the Future Force, Guaranteeing American Leadership in a Contested Environment. We have a great afternoon for you, starting with a former Deputy Secretary of Defense and ending with the current uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense. Uh, a little bit about this report, and uh, um, Deputy Secretary Lind will, will give more on this. This report focuses is squarely on the future of warfare and it looks at what our adversaries are trying to do particularly in acquiring advanced technologies so that they can blind our forces and keep them at arm's length and it finishes with a number of very concrete recommendations and we'll obviously be doing more work over the term of the project on this set of issues for beating these innovations, um, many of which will be discussed today, but particularly, as you'll see in the report, for ensuring that the United States always is first to find, fix, and finish adversary forces. Uh, so that's what we're about today. Uh, we are grateful for the support that we've received from so many of you for this effort and particularly for the Advisory Council's help that we put together to support the project Evolving the Future Force, uh, which is made up of some of the best and brightest minds in the fields of defense, government, academia, and industry. Uh, on a more personal note, we're also today celebrating the life and work at the center of our former Vice President, Sean Brimley. This was his last CNAS project. And to talk a little bit more about Sean, we welcome today my spectacular predecessor, uh, Michelle Flournoy, who, as you all know, has gone on to start Washington's newest and hottest strategic advice firm, West Exec. Please welcome Michelle. Thank you, um, and thanks everybody for being here for the rollout of a really, um, I thought, think innovative and important report. But this report was the last project that Sean Brimley, our beloved former CNAS executive director, or executive vice president and director of studies, uh, worked on before he died of colon cancer in January. Both the ideas in the report and the collaborative way in which it was developed are a testament to Sean's extraordinary leadership, so we wanted to honor him today. As a thought leader, as you all know, Sean was always pushing all of us to look farther into the future, to assess what was coming over the horizon, to think creatively about how the United States would ensure that we'd be ready to meet future challenges and seize emerging opportunities. The seminal report that Sean co-authored with Bob Work, uh, you recall 20YY, Preparing for War in the Robotic Age, became the intellectual foundation of what we now know as the third offset strategy that Bob Work then drove forward into practice in the Pentagon when he was Deputy Secretary of Defense. Um, much of that visionary thinking about the future of warfare and what the United States must do to ensure it can deter and, if necessary, prevail in an environment of intensified great power competition is updated and refined in the report that we're releasing today. Today, the recommendations outlined in this report are even more critical uh, given the current security environment, the return of a more aggressive Russia, the rise of a more powerful China. The United States must pursue the steps that we outline in this report with a new level of focus and resources and urgency if we are to maintain our military technological edge in a far more contested future security environment. But just as important as the substantive insights and recommendations in this report was the way in which it was put together. It's hard to think of someone who is more committed and impactful in growing the next generation of national security thinkers and leaders than Sean Brimley. 
Sean could have written this report alone. He could have just written it with his senior colleagues. But he chose instead to recruit three young CNAS researchers, whose names are also on the report, to be collaborators and co-authors. He understood the opportunity that a task force and a report like this represents to bring the voices of a new generation to, of defense experts into the debate and to further the development their, sorry, to further the, their development as defense analysts. Since its founding, as you know, CNAS has always been uh, about futures, not formers, and growing the next generation of national security thinkers has been a core part of our mission and our culture since the start. But Sean was really our ro role model on how to actually translate this core institutional value into practice. He lived it every day, mentoring dozens and, and dozens of young professionals while actively supporting the advancement of his peers. So this report is dedicated to the memory and the example of our dear colleague and friend, Sean Brimley, who not only drove our analysis to be better, more strategic, more bold, and innovative, but also dedicated himself to mentoring, advancing so many others in the field. So thank you for allowing us to take this moment to remember and recognize Sean's contributions, and I'll turn it back over to Toria. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, as you all know, to set the scene for today's panel and to give you a little bit of a teaser on what's in the report, we are very pleased to have uh, former Deputy Secretary of Defense Bill Lind with us. As you know, he was Deputy Secretary from 2009 to 2011 under Secretaries Gates and Panetta. And in that position, he personally led DOD's efforts in cybersecurity, space strategy, and energy policy, a leading innovator in his own right. Uh, now he is CEO of Leonardo DRS. He is also a very committed member of the Center's Board of Advisors and a member of the Future Force Advisory Council for this report. Given his own extensive experience in and out of government, and at that cutting edge between industry and government, I can't think of anybody better to get us smart on these issues than Secretary Lin. Thank you for being with us. Th thanks very much, Toria. It's uh, Terrific that you've you've taken the helm of uh, the center. I, it's uh, benefited from uh, great leadership originally with uh, Kurt and Michelle and then uh, John and and Nate and then uh, Bob and again Michelle and now uh, I, I think uh, they're handing the baton to you and I think it couldn't be in in better hands. So it, good luck and. Michelle, thank you for not only everything you did for uh, uh, the center, but, but um, for the recognition of, of Sean, someone uh, that we, we all worked closely with, uh, not just at uh, CNAS, but also in the Pentagon, where uh, uh, he was one, truly one of the leading thinkers, and it's a, it's a terrible loss the, to, to lose him uh, mid-career mid like this. Um, it is, I think, a, a, a fitting tribute that uh, as we recognize Sean, uh, as we release uh, this report, uh, he, I think, reminds us of why we're here today. He said at one point, the United States must dare to imagine ways of fighting that may defy conventional wisdom, but harness America's unique advantages. And I think that's what this report uh, tries to do. We're, we're living in an era of technological innovation. But unlike in the past, the majority of that disruption is originating outside the U.S. defense industrial base. During the Cold War, America's technological edge on the battlefield largely stemmed from Pentagon investments, or investments of the uh, industrial base supporting the Pentagon in missiles and satellites, precision munitions, stealth technology. In contrast, the current environment re resembles more that of the late 19th century when the commercial sector generated game-changing innovations like the telegraph and the railroad. 
Warfare, first transformed by the Industrial Revolution, then by the Atomic Revolution, is today being revolutionized by the Information Age. Combined with the spread of cutting-edge technology around the world, in Europe, Russia, China, and the Middle East, and Southeast Asia, globalization has created a much larger group of state and non-state actors with lethal military technology that can threaten America and its allies. For centuries, the most economically developed nations yielded or wielded the most potent military power, while developing countries and insurgent groups had little or no access to highly lethal weapons. That's changed. Today, that linear relationship between economic power and military power no longer holds true. Terrorist groups with few resources can defeat our most advanced armor with fertilizer bombs. A small group of trained programmers using off-the-shelf equipment can develop first-strike cyber weapons. Rogue states are developing nuclear weapons. Today, lethality at the low end of the spectrum can match that at the high end. Meanwhile, traditional national powers are seeking asymmetric capabilities over U.S. conventional superiority. Anti-access and area denial weapons that are discussed in this report are central to the growing asymmetric attempt to keep us far away from contentious zones. The vast proliferation of precision strike technology specifically challenges America's historic ability to project power to distant parts of the globe. With so many high-end and low-end threats, America's future force must have a suite of capabilities to maximize our versatility across the widest spectrum of conflict in history. In other words, we must invest in emerging technologies like fifth-generation fighters and bombers and at the same time invest in ways to counter IEDs. Yet America retains vast and unparalleled national resources combined with our unbridled creativity. We are limited only by the extent of our imaginations and must not squander the opportunity to redefine military conflict by investing to fight the last war. To the contrary, think for a minute about the amazing possibilities like those envisioned in the Future Force report. Thousands of space and airborne ISR platforms networked into constellations that are aided by artificial intelligence. Robotic swarmed networks together for lethal attacks or intelligence collection. Hypersonic weapons traveling at speeds greater than Mach 5. Directed energy and high power microwave weapons for a range of lethal and non-lethal applications unmanned stealth bombers for long-range strikes. And of course, the creative imagination of many of these technologies being turned into increasingly autonomous systems. The good news is the Pentagon's R&D budget has increased since 2015, with many of its efforts focused on art artificial intelligence and big data analytics, as well as integrated weapon systems. The Pentagon has devoted substantial resources to hypersonic and directed energy weapons, autonomous systems, electromagnetic railguns, as well as new undersea, space, cyber, and electronic warfare systems. This new funding provides the engine of change, since a strategy without resources is more or less just an essay. Organizations like the Center for a New American Security and events like the one today that bring together government and industry help us imagine the future. They help the Pentagon analyze the U.S. response and solutions to complex national security issues. To paraphrase my old boss, Secretary Bob Gates, we have a perfect track record when it comes to predicting when and where we will fight. We never get it right. But we must have much we have a much better track record on forecasting how we will fight in the future with new and emerging technologies, 
And that's why we're here today. Leonardo DRS has proudly supported multiple studies by the Center for a New American Study that are helping to shape the future force. Creative disruption focused on the globalization of the defense industry and the huge impact of commercial technology on our military. While we can, looked at ways that DOD could modernize in the third offset strategy. And Future Foundry recommended the defense industry's response to the impact of commercial technology on defense. And now we have the future of the study evolving the future force. I think that this body of work has helped the Pentagon and other defense agencies think about the future, build on this work, invest in these technologies, and continue the technological advantage that has marked our military for the past six decades. In concluding, I'd like to remind everyone of America's response to Soviet aggression during the Cold War. The Soviet Union's conventional forces vastly outnumbered ours. This demanded that we create a qualitative technological edge for U.S. warfighters. Our choice then was to prioritize investment in fewer but more lethal and accurate platforms and systems to generate game-changing capabilities. Long-range cruise missiles, stealth technologies, and precision guidance more than leveled the playing field and help keep America safe for a generation. But our past success does not guarantee that the U.S. will always enjoy a technological edge in war. As Secretary Mattis has said, victory is not our birthright. While those before us successfully transitioned the U.S. defense industrial base to adjust to the global environment, we need to redouble our efforts to do that exact task in the current time frame. I am confident that Secretary Mattis would agree that America's ability to anticipate and react to change to build the future force to our battlefield advantages remains unparalleled. Our future on the battlefield once again lies in our own hands. The goal will be to achieve as effective a transition as we did in the last generation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. That was a great warm up and teaser, uh, as predicted. Uh, our first panel this afternoon is going to examine how the future force will need to hide their targets and find adversaries' targets first in, the ne in, in future fights. It's going to be moderated by the Center's Acting Director for Studies and the Leonie Panetta Senior Fellow, Lauren de Young Schulman. And we look forward to a great discussion. Lauren. those who are here to pay tribute to my really good friend and former boss, Sean Brimley. Uh, when Sean and I first met many years ago in Washington, we had an in-joke that was basically, you knew you would make it, you had made it in Washington when you had created a buzzword that was circulated so widely in defense strategies or budget arguments or think tank reports or congressional hearings that it had basically lost all meaning. People repeated it so often that they had forgotten what it really meant and why it was so important to the force. And that's why I think he would love this event today in that it's bringing the defense community together to force them to really dive into what does, what do these concepts of find, fix, and finish actually mean in terms of investment, future doctrine, experimentation, culture, human capital, and many other critical elements to the department. Getting beyond the buzzwords and thinking about how is the future of warfare changing, 
How should we adapt concepts of operation? How is technology contributing to these changes in future warfare? And how should we think about the future of warfare if we want to be successful? And I have a panel here far more qualified to discuss these issues than I am. Um, first, we have Chris Pearson, the Vice President for Strategic Development at General Atomics Aeronautical Systems. And then Mackenzie Eaglin, a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And Jim Thomas, a principal at the Telemus Group and a former OSD alumni like myself. Uh, so I want to start by being, no surprise to those who know me, incredibly wonky, and having a wonky aside for a second, uh, remi reminding everyone that our friend Clausewitz is not a huge fan of intelligence. He does not think there is great utility in intelligence and does not think it can actually penetrate the fog of war to the extent that it can actually be useful to future war fighters. But all major advances in war warfare over the last couple of decades, from precision guided munitions to lethal drones, and many other capabilities all really depend on very precise targeting da data, knowing where your adversary is and finding him first before he finds you. And more actors are developing both this pre these precision capabilities as well as advanced ISR in line with what we have now. And as the CNES report released today says, any successful force development strategy aimed at deterring and defeating America's adversaries must focus first on shortening the interval from detection and location of a target to its ultimate destruction. And America's adversaries are developing their forces to fight exactly this way. Or as my friend and colleague Paul Shar says, in a much briefer sort of way, the contest of hiding and finding is gonna define much of future warfare. The, ra the range and lethality of modern weaponry means that whichever state's forces are consistently able to stay hidden longer and define enemy targets first will have a real strategic military advantage. So by way of opening remarks, uh, I wanted to first ask the panel, what is the most important future investment in the, that the US military can make in the future force? Hiding or finding? And of course, any other remarks you'd like to make in, in a, on this topic as well. I'll start with you, Chris. Sure, thank you, Lauren. And I want to thank CNAS for this very important project involving the future force. Critical time in our national security to address these issues, so it's a, it's a great opportunity. Um, and find is such a broad topic. It's one word, but it means so much. And I, I would like to expand the definition and say it's really about persistent shared situational awareness. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll beg to differ with Clausewitz, and I know that's blasphemy, but yeah. I think he's wrong. Intelligence does matter. Information does matter. As Secretary Lynn alluded to in his opening remarks, we're in the age of information warfare. This is information dominance. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, it used to be a man on horseback with field glasses looking across the field of battle, and, and that was the information he could collect and gather and make tactical decisions. Today, it's much more complex. So Multi-domain, you have cyber domain, we have space, air, land, sea, undersea. And having the situational awareness to be able to act on the, the data that gets distilled to information that gets distilled to actionable intelligence is, is so critical. Yeah. And as we look at a near-peer com competition today with like Russia and China where we're pushed out of the A2AD environment or out of the, uh, the edge of the A2AD, we have to have things like penetrating ISR, mm -hmm. something that's survivable and persistent. We have to had, have uh, investment in overhead assets, things that can not be touched necessarily by the adversary, although those have their own vulnerabilities. And uh, even at the margin, these persistent platforms that can maybe stay outside of a threat envelope but still have the sensors and ability to look deep across borders, especially during the phase zero and, and the build up to conflict. And then you have to corroborate this intelligence. You can't just rely on one source, of, you know, imagery or radar. You have to corroborate that with cyber and really get to the intent of what, what the enemy is thinking, what his action is, and then really dominate that decision cycle and in information. So penetrating ISR, um, overhead imagery, and then the right sensors on your persistent platforms that are, that are survivable at the edge or at the outside of a threat envelope. Mackenzie? It's a great question. I like, uh, I like the way it's posed because it makes it easy to answer. So where I'm going to say both are good and some more, some extra. So hiding is good. It's important. I think it'll increasingly be easier and cheaper to do it with additive manufacturing in particular. But it's still more reactionary than it is offensive. So finding is really ideal, I think. And you have to be able to do both because the enemy is going to do both. Uh, and I, I like Chris's points a lot. You know, the, the manipulation of data mm -hmm. is not just something we want to think about being able to do, but if you look at, uh, I hate to bring up such a touchy topic, but we all are familiar with the Russian meddling in the presidential elections. Okay. So 
the question is, is to turn the telescope around and say, well, what if somebody's manipulating our data, you mean the military? So we want to be able to do that to others to create uncertainty, but when you get the data, as Chris was alluding to, and you're looking at it or trying to process it or consuming it, what if the data's wrong? Because if they can manipulate your elections, as you say, they can't manipulate your, your military hardware and software just as easily. I mean, it really is similar. I don't think that there's anything, maybe some encryption is different and things like that. But uh, so I, I want to hide. I want to find more than I want to hide, but I, I definitely want to do both. And I want to hide cheaply, more cheaper than we are hiding now, more abundantly than we are, which is possible with, I think, what's coming online. And I want to find. But what do I really want to do after I do both of those? What I really want to do is then make the, the data the most relevant it can be for decision makers. Because if you, and I'll keep hitting on this theme, you're going to find me a broken record at the end of our short time together. It's all about the decision making, right? It's about feeding the decision making. And the assumption is always that once you have the data, you've found something that you attack it. But perhaps the decision making will become better and more informed and broader than just targeted focused, meaning on a target, mm -hmm. you know, more than a warhead on a forehead. Is it going to give you bigger information about the bigger picture uh, beyond the target, meaning what's happening around it, what's happening with it, what's happening with the people, uh, the thinking, the why is it there and not over there? And so you have this, you know, block wide view or community wide view. So it's the finding of the target is terrific. And we, wa we want to keep getting better at it, right? Wh whatever the next precision guided munition revolution is. And I think we, we're talking about what that is today, part of it. AI, big data fusion, hypersonic, et cetera, directed energy, all of those I think are in that revolution. Jim's the expert on that. But uh, are we going to, whatever we're going to do with it, is it going to be better than what we've done with it? Meaning it's beyond the fixing part, mm -hmm. or excuse me, the finishing. And the finishing is crucially important, but gee, aren't the best wars the ones you don't fight? And aren't they the cheapest and the shortest after all? So I want to do that and then some more. Okay. Jim? Um, well, first, uh, my compliments to CNAS and Tori and Richard and um, Michelle for your lovely tribute to Sean. Um, a great question off the bat. And I guess I'd say with a lot of these things, it's, it's never a question of do you want wheels on your car, do you want a steering wheel, you want both. <laughs> and hiding and finding really is no different from that. Um, it it's really is going to be about the power of combinations. We're certainly entering what appears to be a uh, finder dominant uh, error and, and competition uh, relative to, to hiding. Uh, but hiding is going to remain critical. And when we say that it's, it's fight, finder dominant, it doesn't mean finder absolute supremacy. Uh, so you can still hide in a finder dominant world. Um, I guess what I'd say in terms of uh, broad themes for investment, for, especially for DOD and our allies, would be um, uh, three combinations in particular that look uh, very compelling. And I think the first is uh, a combination of uh, being able to find and being able to hide. Uh, because in many cases, you're going to have to penetrate into uh, denied or highly contested environments. So the only way you get there to find is going to be to hide. Uh, and that may be through um, a variety of, of, of techniques, uh, both um, in the electromagnetic spectrum, in the visual spectrum, uh, in the acoustic spectrum, uh, undersea, et, et cetera. And so uh, we're going to have to find uh, ways of, um, with, with low probability of detection, being able to get to where we need to get to be able to find. I think the second is, um, and, I, and this kind of builds on a point McKinsey was making, is the combination between finding and knowing. Um, that we're not going to have kind of the opportunities we had in the Cold War where there are lots of bright, shiny objects around. It's a very target-rich environment. It's just a question of can I, can I, can I get a weapon there? Um, we're going to be in an environment which is much more congested. It's much more confusing. Uh, we're going to have to be much more discriminant. And I would say that is not only the case when it comes to thinking about our adversary and the projection of red forces and, and, and how you think about uh, intercepting or engaging um, hostile forces, but it's also knowing ourselves. And, and this is really, I think, the point that McKinsey was, was getting at is that 
Um, I think we're going to have entirely new uh, intelligence disciplines that emerge. If you think about traditional HUMINT and SIGINT and ELINT, et cetera, I think we're going to have to evolve some sort of veracity intelligence uh, where we know ourselves and we know our own databases and we know our own uh, patterns of life exquisitely so that we can do change detection and know when someone actually is attacking us. And we're going to have to do the same thing against our adversaries. This, I think, also brings out uh, perhaps a new uh, operational mission, which is kind of similar to traditional military deception of what I would call uh, verisimilitude, where it's the ability to do things that are truth-like uh, and how you essentially are able to make very small changes in the databases of an adversary or in their force composition in ways that advantage you and disadvantage them. And I think the last is, um, Maybe, I have some issues with the old kind of uh, find, fix, finish uh, breakdown. I think we're heading towards a period of unification and the last integrative combo I would throw out is finding and striking. Is that as long as you're there and you're finding something, you might as well kill it. Um, and so thinking about how you're going to have a unification the, the, the kind of the, the apotheosis of, of you know, Marshall Ogarkov's reconnaissance strike complex is going to be critical, where you have strike capable reconnaissance systems. And you know, I'd say those three combinations should be informing how we think about our future uh, ISR uh, uh, capability portfolio in the future. Okay, so on that note, DOD released its defense strategy last December and came out with its fiscal year 19 uh, defense budget, uh, or, I guess, last month. And this was really one of the biggest, biggest and latest opportunities DOD has had to change its investment picture. It's probably the largest increase we'll have in the defense budget for the coming years, at least based on the current p political picture. And by their own words, this was their first chance to really put into motion how DOD sees its defense strategy and we can put that on paper in some ways. So I'd like to ask my panel, particularly Mackenzie, uh, who has done quite a bit of work thinking about what investments DOD should be making in the future force to grade their homework a little, at least in terms of thinking through these challenges we're discussing here today. Did DOD put uh, enough on the table to address the ISR, the space, the artificial intelligence capabilities that it will need in the future to get out this challenge of finding targets that we're talking about today? And other panelists could talk, chime sure. in as well. Sure. First, I want to credit uh, CNES alum and still affiliate Deputy Secretary Bob Work uh, for all of his many years of thinking and work on the third offset strategy. And thank goodness he did it. Uh, and I, I think critically important, the right question or challenge to solve, to think about operationally and strategically. In many ways, he was the brainchild. Secretary Carter got the credit, but I really think Bob Work was, was the author. And he had a great executioner in uh, Dr. Will Roper running the Strategic Capabilities Office, for example, though there are many other players involved. I'm a little concerned that, however, um, the longevity of the lifespan of it now, in the absence of those two gentlemen in those kinds of positions, with Dr. Roper in the Air Force and Bob work moving on to other important work. So uh, it's an, I believe third offset in, in these questions are, they're so important. It wasn't even that much money to begin with. I mean, a couple years ago, it was only 18 billion over five years. So that's a modest investment when we're talking. It's a lot of money, of course, but it's a modest investment over a defense budget so large. Uh, so when I look at the, putting that in context, when I look at the 19 numbers, I see some progress made on some of these investments, and we already ticked them down the line, uh, but it's still really largely exploratory. Mm -hmm. And I don't see enough actual substantive shift into the application of that. Now, some of it could be technology related. It could be that it's not mature enough uh, to come onto military, uh, to sort of take commercial applications and bring them into certain military uh, assets or capabilities or, or even technology sets. But it's not fast enough progress. And if this is the high watermark, and Susanna and Lauren did a great job, they're right. This is really the peak of, I mean, it's, it's strange that you can predict the apex of defense spending the years that you're in it, but that's exactly where we are. And so this really is the moment. And everything from here on out only gets harder because you have to take something from something, you know, there's more trade-offs involved in the future investment. And 
this is a different Secretary of Defense. The good news is his lethality focus seems to be a theme of, you know, it seems to be sort of in line um, intuitively with fine, fix, and finish. Uh, but there are, that's a whole other issue uh, that we could talk about in terms of the guidance behind that or the lack of. You know, sort of what lethality means department wide, not just for one service or one domain. Uh, and then so across these applications of what we think now are these investments. So, so you ask the question, how are they doing? And I would say, so then we're looking at, you mentioned space, space and satellite in particular, I would say. Uh, 3D manufacturing, hypersonics, definitely that's, that's probably one of the brighter spots. Mm -hmm. Directed energy, that's been a long time coming. I mean, directed energy investments haven't just been recent. I mean, that's the start of DDG 1000. This has been going on with the railgun for a long, long time. Um, but still plugging along and doing well. I'd say hypersonics and directed energy are probably the brightest spots. Uh, but, but the data fusion and uh, the AI and the machine learning, basically where, which is where you're going to get the heart of how to improve, find, fix, and finish, it's not great. It's really status quo evolutionary progress, but I don't see anything advancing forward enough where next year when you have this panel, I could tell you that, wow, this thing is new and different and it changed something on the ground. Mm -hmm. and that's making me a little concerned. Jim or Chris, anything to add to that? Uh, I thought, go ahead, please. Uh, sure, uh, thanks. Um, so the new national defense strategy, I think really did focus on existential threats mm -hmm. to, to our nation and really gave a, a good focus for national security priorities. Um, the counterterrorism, contingencies that we've been involved with for decades now are, are probably not going away, uh, but we can't lose sight of that, that higher end fight. And I, I think investment in, in the AI and machine learning, things like that, you know, traditionally or historically, I'm, I'm sorry, we had Apollo program and DARPA and things like that, and it was the government that was leading cutting edge research, but, but now it's, it's really from the commercial sector and in those areas. I think DOD still has to focus on those military applications like hypersonics and direct energy, that, that's very important. But um, the adversaries today, even, even though we talk about near peer, it's, it, it's, it's going to be a form of hybrid warfare. The, the war by proxy in other, other parts of the world, the ungoverned spaces, the counterterrorism, counterinsurgency is not going to go away. So we have to find the balance between that and, and, the, and the high end fight. And um, it's not so much in a, a, a necessarily a military dominion, it's, it's a multi domain dominion. It's, it's commercial, it's economic, it's really about the world order. It, it's China rising as, as a world player and trying to disrupt the world order more in their favor, or, or even you know, the nihilist philosophy of ISIS that wants to disrupt a world order and, and create a caliphate or something. So, so those are the, the real whole of government challenges that we face, not just on DOD, and I, I think we're, our paltry investment in, in the, the non-military aspects is something that, that we need to address in the, down, down the road in the future. So I want to pick up on a point that you just made there, um, that uh, I think it's not just about the technology that we're investing in. Uh, in many ways, the challenge we're talking about in terms of like the enormous amounts of data, the, the shape of the threat that we'll be facing is going to require a far more kind of flat networked force and also just whole of government or whole of whatever you want to call it, uh, solution to be able to address some of this. And DOD is, as we all know and love, the most hierarchical centralized command and control. Things are, are far more, less flexible than you might otherwise want it to be in terms of confronting future threats. Are there new thoughts about how the future force should organize, uh, the kinds of experiments that it should be thinking about in terms of how it can adapt to be more flexible in, in addressing some of these future threats? Some folks have thoughts on that? Well, um, if you think about our command and control systems, they really uh, were all developed for, um, for human execution of various tasks. And one of the things that's um, a real limitation of humans is it's, it's hard to multitask beyond the single digits. Uh, so you now have um, possibilities with human machine teaming um, for radically different concepts of command and control where you can think about operational and tactical span, uh, which is much, uh, much broader uh, than, than anything we've, we've, we've had previously. Um, so thinking about how we're going to have hybrid command and control systems is going to be important. I think the other part of this is that um, so much in the past has been focused on pulling information to the center and processing it and then pushing back uh, commands uh, to the edge. 
and we're moving into an era where just we're going to end up not only collecting information at the edge, but we're going to process it and make decisions at the edge as mm -hmm. well, uh, which will radically increase speed. I think that's the defining characteristic. So when we think about hypersonics, we think about speed as the one of the most important features of the of attributes of warfare in the future. Uh, but it's not often thought about enough in terms of decision making. And so if I put together collectively, so there's better data collection. We, have, we collect actually too much data now. So I should say better, we'll continue to collect ever more. But better data analysis, right? And that's the fusion part. Uh, that's where you bring in the machine learning and the algorithms to help, you know, Majority of the collected data is not watched, and most of it's benign anyway. You don't need to watch it. It's pattern of life. You want a machine to scan it anyway. Uh, but everyone can do pattern recognition. It's not necessarily saying these are the trends or these are the patterns, but predicting, then what will the enemy do next? That's sort of the next level to borrow a quote from General McMaster. Uh, but the machine can help with that because decisions are often made by many series of sub-decisions and create, you know, adding a value set to each of that. How far away is the enemy? How is that moderate or low or high level of certainty? Uh, is, is the payload aligned properly? Do I have a high probability of, of being successful if I strike the target? So all of these sub-decisions are usually made in milliseconds or by a human or even faster. Um, and the machine can do that as well, which is so you could foresee a future like the Air Force does with the fighter in an armed drone, you know, a, a human, a pilot flown fighter with an armed drone next to it to support those decision making uh, points. But even a step from beyond that, what would it really, what, what's the net benefit that it could really give decision makers? And beyond, by decision makers, I mean beyond the pilot. I mean the pilot who's feeding more information to Sort of a Washington audience, for example, it can probably give them some of what they lack the most of. And it's not money, and it's not authority, although I know that's usually the complaint, but time. Mm -hmm. and time is what is one of the hardest things that you can buy or come by in Washington, D.C. And better information should lead to more time so that you can make a better decision about what to do with that information. So I'm going to turn it over to the audience. If folks have questions, just raise your hand. I think we have microphones on both sides of the room right now with Tom and Emma. Michelle? So I've heard department, department leadership talk about being able to fail faster and fail more, you know, fail more elegantly in the future, which I, I think that's part of the culture change from a lot of these, driven by a lot of these reforms that we've seen in recent years. And that's great, and that's super important. And the Hill even claims to be on board, particularly the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, but then I see scenarios where, you know, uh, was it the Uber self-driving car and the fatality recently? And then all of a sudden there's this just, um, which is tr tragic and awful. But then the reaction is to overcorrect, right? To stop everything that we're doing and, uh, and stand down. So the rhetoric is right. Fail fast and fail elegantly. When, when uh, the chairman of the Defense Transformation Board, Eric Schmidt, uh, president of Alphabet, when he was discussing some of these issues, he basically said, um, you know, DOD is the opposite of Google slash Alphabet. 
99 out of 100 people bring stupid ideas and they fail. And we clap and we applaud those employees every time they do it because the one out of the 100 that will work is going to work spectacularly. It'll be the self-driving car that doesn't you know, fail. And, um, and I think the words are right, but they, we are so far from the culture change. And I just don't know how you do that without the right person who cares about it, who's there long enough, uh, where there's continuity among administrations in this. I'm, it's, a, it's so much harder. I wish it were easier that it could be something legislatively fixable. Uh, I think the spirit and intent is there, but I'm not sure that we're actually seeing it in practice. I, I could add on, on that a, a second. I really like what the Army's doing with Futures mm -hmm. Command. Uh, went to a dinner with General Pawlikowski a few weeks ago. And she talked about with our current acquisition system, we build in should cost and predictability. From day one of the program, we want to know what it's going to look like 10 years from now. And it really is a culture change. We, we have to get into a mindset of prototyping, being able to uh, go to a certain point and then re-vectoring. Re and we don't allow that in our current acquisition system. Uh, a good example is you know, the Air Force has their SPO and they have Big Safari. They both comply with the same DOD 5000 regulations, but Big Safari has a reputation for moving so much faster. And it's really about their attitude about how they implement things, you know, getting to yes versus looking for the first reason to say no. Mm -hmm. Next question, sir. Uh, I'm Carl Littleman. I'd like to thank Toria and Michelle for putting this together. Um, let me talk the panel a little bit. Uh, you've been focusing on the tactical and technical level. Uh, certainly since the Korean War, the one reality is that the United States, every time it has used force, has had overwhelming technological superiority. And we haven't done very well. We lost in Vietnam. The second Iraq war in Afghanistan have not done well. We won into Libya in 2011, so forth. Now, taking what you've been talking about in terms of finding, fixing, so forth, uh, the defense strategy calls on four principal adversaries. Russia, who's got a preponderance of nuclear weapons. China, who's got an infinite number of people, probably more people than we have bullets. North Korea and Iran, and you may recall 40 years ago when the Department of Defense did its Persian Gulf study, when Iran was on our side, it was going to take some three or 400,000 Americans to get to the Zargos Mountains to prevent the Russians or Soviets from coming south. So how do you take what you've been talking about on a tactical and technical level mm -hmm. and apply it to the possibility or the contingency of real war against nuclear armed, dangerous people who outnumber us in terms of their populations and really have the great advantage if we fight of having a home field. So who wants that really easy question? <laughs> well, you know, I think it's a great question. Um, first of all, I think war between nuclear power, non-nuclear war or limited nuclear war between major nuclear powers is still a possibility. Um, I think that the, the scope, um, all parties would have an interest in keeping the scope very, very limited. Um, and I think this is one where, uh, as we think about the application of, um, of, of various technologies, uh, we're, we're having to think in a much more constrained way about just as our adversaries are looking at how they deny us the ability to project power, we're going to be thinking about how we can use these similar technologies in a countervailing way to deny them the ability to project power locally uh, around their borders. Um, but then I think we're getting into this much broader area, which is uh, warfare is being, uh, the, the definition of warfare is really being expanded right now. And so we're having to think a lot more about the integration of measures of violence and, um, and nonviolent means in terms of either imposing, uh, imposing your will or altering the will of, of your adversary um, uh, in, 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 in some context. And I think our in intelligence systems and our knowing systems are going to have to reach into those nonviolent areas as well. I love the question too. I'm, I'm only gonna try and tackle a part of it in a quick answer. So finding, you could argue, is you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an, a tactical importance. But could it have strategic effects if we broaden its definition? Meaning, the finding, fixing, and finishing is, by nature of its definition, of targets, in war. But if we can do all the finding better 
and by that I mean the, all of the things hiding and finding, et cetera, but I mean of the find, fix, finish, find. All this better data fusion and analysis and pattern and then predictions, et cetera, then instead of just focusing on what that means for the target, perhaps we could consider is the use of military force going to achieve our strategic goals as a result of what we now know by focusing on that target. I think it can absolutely have strategic effects that are much more bigger and consequential and more beneficial. The problem and the culture and the bureaucracy, and right now I'm picking on the intelligence community, it's not necessarily their fault, but the finding, fixing, and finishing is of targets and it's of terrorists in particular. To the point where, uh, you know, Mike Pompeo has said, like, we didn't really have any intelligence on North Korea because, you know, we've just been busy focused on this problem set. Mm -hmm. It's an important one and I get it. But it cannot be at the exclusion of everything else. And it shouldn't just be about the target and its elimination. It should be about the use of force once you have that data on the target and whether that's the right answer. Is it going to get you the political effects that you're trying to achieve? I think there is lots of questions here. Mr. Blue. I'm uh, Neil Blue, CEO of General Atomics. Uh, and uh, this interesting discussion centers around the issue of finding, which is another expression of situational awareness. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, one, one observation uh, about situational awareness is the importance of persistence. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason why Pompeo might have observed about North Korea well, we really didn't have much intelligence. Uh, is that, that was a true statement because there was no persistent situational awareness relating to North Korea. And so, uh, what are the means available to achieve that result? On the one hand, you have, you have persistent, two days long airborne uh, surveillance capability uh, over international waters, if you apply that to the, the Korean uh, example. Uh, and to the extent that you want to be at nadir, directly overhead, to, to have an understanding of the target, or let's say an understanding that yields situational awareness. Uh, you've got uh, the, the technology of uh, LEO satellite systems, uh, which if, if uh, properly uh, uh, engaged in a uh, network configuration, can provide what? the fundamental essence of endurance. Endurance is what provides real situational awareness. That's what Pompeo obviously acknowledged that, that, that the United States hasn't had. And, and you have the episodic ability maybe to fly a stealthy uh, airplane uh, for two hours over, over the target area. Uh, the residence time of a Leo sat, maybe 30, uh, uh, seven seconds over the, based upon the orbital, orbital global time. The bottom line, however, is that the technologies available today to provide the one essence that can yield real situational awareness. And that, the, these are platforms uh, which are capable of watching all the time, 24-7. An important observation. If you combine that with big data processing, then you achieve on, a, on an automated electronic basis, uh, what is really situational awareness, which yields the result of this panel, which is the finding. But really, the finding is the understanding of and the, and the development of situational awareness persistently, 24-7. It's not episodic, and it cannot be accomplished by fast mover airplanes, which have to be refueled by an airborne filling station uh, within two hours or they have to land. Thank you. Go ahead, Jim. I, mean, I think that that's a great comment. Um, two things. One is I think there's a trade-off between persistence and exquisiteness. And I think that here's an area where DOD and the, and the broader intelligence community may be diverging over time. That it's not just about chasing the next exquisite sensor, but DOD is going to be probably far more interested than the broader uh, intelligence community in terms of trying to achieve that kind of persistence. Um, 
And I think the other is the complementarity between a proliferated LEO constellation that's providing persistence uh, and air breathing sensors that um, are, are a little more episodic, but they can, I think the air breathing can still fill some uh, kind of critical gaps in coverage, even with a persistent constellation uh, that's useful. And then lastly, I'd say you're still going to have a need for uh, some large buses uh, for some exquisite sensors, perhaps in other orbits as well. And so it's really just the balance um, that we're going to have in the future. But I think you're quite right that the big growth area is potentially going to be this proliferated LEO constellation. Good. Next over here, and I've neglected this side of the room, so if anyone has a question here, just flag me down very blatantly. Right over here. Bill Sweetman with Northrop Grumman. Um, on, this, on the side of our ability to hide things, um, one thing that keeps occurring to me that was that in, in 2014 in the Ukraine, um, it proved impossible to hide a single missile launcher uh, because there were so many people on the ground who were basically carrying a real-time connected um, geotagged reconnaissance sensor mm -hmm. in their pockets. Um, is that going to make it um, problematic, not to say impossible, um, to, to, to conceal our own forces? And is that going to be an asymmetrical advantage for nations that have their um, internets under better control? Great Bill, question. it's still remarkable that some college kid in Australia unleashed the Fitbit or whatever, the wearable, trackable devices, and hey, look where all these troops are. And look, at they're running uh, loops around the track in Syria. Gee, uh, yeah, no, I, we might have fixed that problem, but the fact that nobody saw it coming, didn't think ahead of time to say, um, gee, this is going to all, this is all, it's like, um, like the Zuckerberg scandal right now, right? Oh my gosh, there's all this data out there and people are tracking it and using it uh, as if that's a surprise to us. But the, anything, that's, that's, what, that's why it's called the Internet of Things, right? Every one of them is emitting something and it's got a sensor in it and it tells a lot of people if they're interested a lot of information. Uh, I give our predictive capabilities in terms of departmental leadership on What's the next Fitbit problem? Uh, low, <laughs> low grade. I hope I'm wrong. I don't know if we learned from it or not. There was a comment earlier today about other types of intelligence, and, and this is a great example of that the OSINT, you know, open source intelligence. But you combine that with the big data analytics, and you're going to have emergent patterns that come out of the data that nobody would have expected. The Fitbits, the, you know, the Facebook, the social media. And we have examples of, uh, of uh, say, a high, high value target takedown in. Syria or something where where it gets tipped off by a Facebook post or uh, you know somebody's Instagramming something, and uh, this is uh, unregulated. It, it's it's a crowdsourced, so it's vulnerable to things like manipulation. Yeah, that's going to have to be tools in our tool set. Just like the elections were manipulated domestically, we're going to have that weaponized. These these are information, are, are tools, and you, know, you have this trade-off between privacy and security. And when you talk about military, especially in an adversarial situation, they become weaponized. We have to be aware of that and defend ourselves against it and also leverage it to our advantage. That, John, did you have a question? You had your hand up a second ago. Bring the microphone. Thanks very much, Don Klein. Uh, question for Mackenzie, secondary, and maybe for, for James. And it's about time. So the first question, that's a great Great example of compression, but what do you, first of all, what do you want to do with it? And secondly, this is probably the more uh, interesting part is we focus a lot on technology, but how we haven't really talked a lot about uh, doctrine and training. Yeah. So if we, if we apply that compression of time to our current decision making, what do we really get out of it as opposed to doing that in conjunction with evolving our decision making and very critically evolving our training, which often takes a secondary or tertiary role to the acquisition of systems themselves. That's my question. Let me try and tackle the first one because I, I don't want to get, con I want to be more clear in what I think is achievable or what should be desirable with time. The effects of all of these, if done right, all of these in types of investments, and I'm going to hope and assume that they will, uh, but particularly the collection, the analysis, the fusion, I want more time, I want faster decision making 
on the tactical level. But I wanted to free up time and I want to slow down time for decision makers on the national command authority level. That's really what I'm trying to get at here. Uh, more time for them to take the better data and make a better decision. I mean, this could obviously apply at each stage in national and in between. You know, I don't, I don't want to pick on easy failures in the past, but you know, the, for example, the, um, the mission in Niger, uh, you know, we're never going to have perfect data, and I'm not hoping for that. And I, it would be silly to think that that would be possible. But you can see where better de decisions, better data helps inform better decisions on that level to do something, or just as important, not to do something. Uh, but on the presidential level, or the chain of six, you know, the, the Speaker of the House level, or Chairman McCain gavel holding, wielding level, what they lack is time, and what they have too much of is noise. Noise, I mean information and data, people, yeah, <laughs> swirling around them. There's so much noise, and there isn't enough time for them to sit and consume, to read the intelligence reports fully. So if the information that's coming up is better, are they getting beyond page one? You know, if it's six pages, I'm not picking on the president here. Uh, can they get beyond, you know, the, the, uh, the overview or the exact sum? Because in some cases, I really think that's what's needed. I think those are the kinds of, the time is gonna be needed for the big questions like Iran and North Korea. And our instinct is that everything's moving faster, so it needs to be, so that even our policymakers' decisions need to be faster on the use of force, and I just, that, horrifies me. I want to slow down time on the decision-making level and give them the one currency that they lack the most of, which is time freed up to think about hard questions. I think there are a couple ways to think about time. One is that there are many actions that we're considering um, that, that you might contemplate that have to be taken uh, or they have to, they have to be um, initiated long in advance of conflict. So you can think about access points and networks and other things that you'd want to achieve. Um, and you can't wait for the, the start of hostilities to, to start gaining that. And that's something I think that's well appreciated. Then there's the issue of um, uh, certain actions that are happening at um, such rapid speed uh, that it's uh, outstripping our traditional command and control approaches. Ballistic missile defense is kind of a classic example. Um, but there are a lot of others in terms of network defense and other things. Um, and as we look ahead, I think time really is one of those critical factors that's really changing in warfare. And it's going to require you know, massive doctrinal shifts. And I think you can see some salient points, such as in ballistic missile defense or in network defense, where there are lessons learned that can be harvested for application in other areas. Um, and this may be an area where the United States uh, perhaps is at an asymmetric uh, disadvantage, right. where some of our adversaries may um, have a greater proclivity to adopt uh, automated decision aids uh, and delegate uh, greater um, uh, authorities uh, for, for actions to, to non-human systems uh, than, than we might. And so that's, that's something that we're going to have to address in the future. First question from this side of the room. Go ahead, yeah, sir. I wanted to, uh, uh, you to expand a little bit about your concerns regarding AI and machine to machine learning adoption within the DOD. In the in IC, that doesn't seem to be the case. There seems to be significant investment in, in IRAD there. So why is there a difference in culture, or is, it, or is it culture, or is it the acquisition cycle, or you know, risk aversion? Why do you see such a difference between what some of the agencies are doing with regards to this versus what the DOD is doing? So before you answer that, I want to add on, tackle my own question, following up on Jim's points about uh, culture, in that uh, you saw particularly in the Obama administration, but not only these can, uh, you know, really intense debates at the principles level about the definition of types of targets in the counterterrorism world and uh, the micromanagement of decisions on the individual targeting. So when you transition this over to artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's a, a level of trust in those capabilities that will have to go from that principle level into those capabilities. That's going to be a, a learning curve for them. And I'd be very curious about your thoughts on how that transition will go and, and what we could do to kind of ease that transition as well. So any of the three on the panel? Um, 
that, that high level of centralized decision making, I think, is important because of the strategic implications. But it's really about the ROE. You know, you know if there's a peer-on-peer -peer fight, you need to go out and find uh, missile launchers. You can launch your fleet of AI, and, and you know, they do the automatic target recognition. And, and I would um, say the investment in DoD's AI machine learning, you, you've probably heard of Project Maven. I, th I think that's getting a lot of traction. Um, there's a lot of interest in that. You know, the big challenges of marking up the metadata, and getting a, a valid data set to, to field that capability. But I, I know with our company, they're talking to us quite a bit about Project Maven and, and putting out uh, the, you know, the persistent platforms that can just autonomously search and tell the human on the loop, not necessarily it's fully autonomous, but a human on the loop, hey, I nominate this area of interest, you better take a look here, rather than a guy looking at a full motion video 24-7, you, you want a machine learning that can kind of nominate mm -hmm. uh, discrepancies or things that are uh, you know, out, of, out of the expected pattern of life. So I think it's going to be a huge cultural problem. And I'm not talking IC versus duty, I'm talking the government versus the rest of us, right? I mean. State Department, they're still using Blackberries or whatever, you know, DOD. Okay, I'm just picking on them. Uh, I joke, uh, but it's true. The last floppy disk was still used last year in our nuclear triad enterprise. Okay, so to give you a sense of truly how slow things move in the Defense Department and across the bureaucracy, even with the good intentions, uh, it's worse than you think. But I, I hear, so exactly what Chris was just saying. So, you know, I hear defense leaderships talk about you know, man in the loop, man on the loop, et cetera, that will always have some man in or on or around the loop because they're afraid. They're afraid of saying, no, no, we're going to have robots killing people or other robots, et cetera. Got it. This is going to have to be led by just society because it's all where we're going anyway. I am 100% comfortable strapping myself and all my kids into a self-driving car probably a few years from now when everyone else is doing it. I understand where we are today, but where we are today is not going to be where we are three years from now. That is being led by the private sector, not the Defense Department. And in fact, that, you know, we've seen this flip in federal R&D and innovation investment. And of course, it used to be led by the government, led by DOD, DARPA and others, which gave us AI, frankly. Siri in your iPhone, Apple bought that from the Defense Department. But these days, the next Siri is now coming from commercial industry that DOD is trying to purchase from them. And so uh, it's going to have to be a culture shift that's already self-evident out in the real world, so to speak. Uh, and I don't think the department will, will get on board until it's already a way of life for everyone else. And that's just, that's just sort of one example in the self-driving car. But fully autonomous systems uh, are going to need to be considered, I think, in future warfare plans, and I, I'm okay with that, but it seems a political hesitancy to say that we'll even think about it or test it or demonstrate it or experiment with it, uh, but it's happening, and it's happening everywhere, not just here or in Silicon Valley, uh, uh, but out beyond the, United, the shores of the U.S., and so the shift is probably going to be forced on the government as opposed to come from internally within. I like the anecdote of Otis invented the elevators in the 1860s, but it took 50 years to get the guy out of the cab for the public to have confidence that it could operate on its own. <laughs> Hopefully our evolution will be faster than that. Okay. Jim, any other? Well, I would just say, um, on this point, when President Truman was um, presented with information uh, about the, the possibility of a, of a, of a hydrogen bomb, um, and he was trying to decide, should, is this something the United States should pursue? His fundamental question was, uh, can, can the Soviets do it? And when the answer is yes, and they're, they're attempting to do it, he said, we don't really have a choice. We're going to have to move forward with the program. And that was super. Um, and I think you have the same thing with AI today. And so as Chris mentioned earlier, I think it really is contextual uh, in terms of thinking about um, lethal applications in the future. Uh, that if you're in all-out war, uh, you, your um, tolerance for automation and automated decision-making is going to go way up uh, when you're closer to a peacetime state and you have to be more highly discriminant, you probably have more time, um, then you may, you, you may want to have um, more man in the loop. Um, the other thing is this question of, you know, are we talking about narrow AI or general AI? Uh, and I think we probably need to be accelerating uh, narrow AI in a lot of areas. And um, here, just as we know the, um, how uh, robotic systems have overcome the physiological limitations of humans when it comes to endurance 
and also the ability to place robotic systems uh, in uh, greater jeopardy in terms of the operational environment. This is another potential example where um, you know, narrow AI and uh, in robotic systems that can operate far forward in denied areas uh, with minimal logistical support um, can uh, you know, greatly improve our, our, our combat effectiveness in, in those areas. But it's an area where um, for all the progress we've made in, in certain areas, there's real latency in DOD when it comes to moving towards uh, strike-capable uh, reconnaissance systems mm -hmm. that can operate in contested areas uh, across all the services. We're just not, we're not going fast enough. Well, I want to thank my panelists. This has been a fantastic discussion, and that was an excellent last question. So uh, we're going to break now until 2.35, slightly longer break since we're running ahead of schedule. But Chris, Mackenzie, Jim, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Thanks, Lauren. Mm -hmm.
Molly? Would you mind sitting over there? I'm sorry to, so I can see you more directly. She's our timekeeper. Uh, <laughs> hey. Yes. <laughs> Keep the time keeper in front of me. <laughs> Off to the side. <laughs> uh, Bob d work did ask me to send you his best. Yeah. That's great. Yes. Yeah. And it's been such a absolute He was very disciplined about it, which was a great gift to us as his staff. Um, ready? Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. My name is Susanna Bloom. I'm a fellow in the defense program at the Center for New American Security. And this is your FIX panel uh, today. I'm, I'll be moderating. And joining me is Christine Fox, who's the Assistant Director for Policy and Analysis at the Johns Hopkins University uh, Applied Physics Laboratory, uh, also Bob Martinage, who's a principal of the Telemus Group, and Vice Admiral Mark Fox, uh, Corporate Vice President of Customer Relations at Huntington Ingalls. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, I think we'll dive right into questions here. And I'd like to start with a bit of a definition of terms. So what do we mean when we're talking about fixing the target? Uh, what is this step, this thing that sometimes happens between find and finish? Uh, and also, how has that concept changed over time? we will start with you, Christine. Okay, sure. So, um, so hello, everybody. Uh, this is a really important topic. I would tell you that the fix part is actually one of the most critical because there's a point where you might first find a fleeting target, but you don't have the time yet to get uh, the, the strike, the next panel, uh, on target. And so you need to hold on to it. That's the fix. Holding on to the target from the time you first see it to the time that you're able to finish it. Now, sometimes you don't find it until it has already gotten to the place where it wants to be to do whatever its intention is, like launch something. And so if the fix phase is too collapsed, there is no fix. There's find and finish. And that's the only opportunity that you have. If you have to wait that long, the opportunity to really finish is very constrained. So fix is really important. You want to find it as early as you can, and then you need to hold custody on it until you can actually finish it. Bob? Uh, I, I think that's a, a pretty good summary. I mean, I think it really has changed a lot over time. So it really goes back a long time, but the, I think the first articulation of find, uh, fix, finish was by uh, General Ridgway during the Korean War. He's kind of uh, extolling his troops are kind of a little downtrodden to go find them, fix them, and finish them. Uh, but the tools he had at his dispos disposal then were primarily, you know, blocking positions, maneuver, artillery and other fires, and, you know, natural and um, man-made obstacles as just kind of the limit. Uh, and then you fast forward about a half a century, and you have General Stan McChrystal, uh, and it kind of takes on a little bit of a different tone, and that, that becomes in hunting down... Um, high-value individuals or terrorists manhunting in Iraq and Af Afghanistan, it becomes about precisely identifying the individual, making sure you have the right individual, uh, locating them in a specific location, then more importantly, uh, making a reliable prediction about when that individual will be in a specific location so that you can go take the finished step. Um, but what I would say, and we'll get to this in a minute, is 
fixing and the need for fixing is really a reflection of where you stand relative to the target and the environment with regard to finding and finishing. And usually, um, you have to fix if you don't have the, really the tools you need to find or there are constraints on your ability to finish. And we can get more to that later. Sure. To give a little bit of a historical context, um, deliberate targeting is the idea that you know where the target is and you've gone through all of the intelligence assessment to be able to launch and then deliver your ordinance on target. This idea now of now dynamic targeting is something that certainly has evolved from, um, okay, how do you know where the target is? And then how do you have the confidence that the location where you're going to employ ordinance is what you really want? And so we've had, and one of the things I think that's important to remember in this discussion is the find, fix, finish. It actually has, there's an exploit and assess and disseminate piece to this was really driven by McChrystal and his team. I mean, it was a JSOC idea of driving. It was a counterinsurgency, kind of a counterterror, and it implies persistent ISRs, was pre, uh, talked about a little bit earlier. And we're now talking about a contested environment where you don't, uh, doing this problem now without a persistent ISR stare is a much more uh, difficult challenge. So fixing in simple terms is, do you have the target in a three-dimensional place that you have the confidence to be able to put ordinance on in, in, in that case? So building on that point, is this challenge becoming easier or more difficult? Are, are we moving It's really in hard. It's yeah. getting harder. Okay. Uh, sure, go ahead. What? I would say it depends, right? So it depends what, A, what are you trying to fix? So there's a difference between say an individual or large surface combatant or a tank or a small co-orbital ASAT and geostationary orbit, you, you get the idea. Uh, so what are you trying to fix? Um, and then where are you trying to do it? Are you doing it on the open ocean and the open desert or are you doing it in a city? Or are you doing it in geostationary orbit again? Or, so it really does, I think, vary. Um, I would say though, agreeing with uh, Admiral Fox, that our ability for a long time to sort of, in the, last couple decades to, uh, to go immediately from the find to finish has improved pretty dramatically for targets, especially on land, at sea, um, and to some degree in the air. But we can only do that in permissive environments. And, and because of adversary investments in a variety of A2AD capabilities, they're pushing our, ability, our finders further away and are, are in the causing a variety of challenges to our finishers. So that's a big, so I would say it is getting harder because of that. But I would also say our adversaries are going into other domains where it's just harder to find, like space, undersea, cyber, uh, that pose different types of challenges. Yeah, I would add to that that um, in addition to the places where it's hard to see them that, that Bob just mentioned, there's tunnels and underground and undercover. And I also do agree that, um, that the fix is harder now because we've been studied. Our abilities to, to find and take out have been studied. And so there's a lot of opportunity now because people kind of know how we operate, what our capabilities are, to think about how to um, hide from those capabilities. Admiral Fox? This concept is really the nexus between operations and intelligence in terms of uh, getting the information that you need for targeting uh, targeting quality uh, location and then being able to service that in a timely fashion if in fact I, a lot of this is a discussion that we've uh, it, it you in inevitably go to the the last 15 years of kind of the going after terrorist networks and that sort of thing when we're talking about full-up conflict here and a contested and a denied environment you don't have the persistent stare or at least you don't have it the way that we have enjoyed it in the past so that now means that goes back to this discussion that we had about well, how do you know what's going on in Korea, uh, in North Korea? Well, you've got to have other ways to do that, or you've got to have other sources uh, to be able to have confidence that you're capable of holding those targets at risk. Well, I mean, yeah, just to build on that. I mean, I think to the extent we can, we would like a joint force in the future to be able to find and finish. 
But the adversary gets a vote and is doing various things to make that more difficult, and that's why you, you inevitably have to do some things in the fixed category. But right now, and I, I think um, um, both Christine and Admiral Fox alluded to, I think the core challenge is, is really in um, that the finders in these A2 and D, A2 AD environments either lack persistence or survivability or some degree uh, accuracy. Um, and our, our finishers in those same A2 and T environments either lack responsiveness or persistence. Um, and the, together you take those and you, you kind of have a problem, right? So the, the, our big problem in the fixing world is really a function of the finding and finishing world. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to develop capabilities for finding and finishing that um, are effective in non-permissive environments. And we've done really great, as I think Emma Fox has alluded to, we can do this in permissive environments. We just can't do it effectively in non-permissive environments. So to come at the same issue from a slightly different angle, what are some of the things that our competitors are doing to complicate this problem, to basically widen the gap between find and finish that, re that requires a fix solution? You, you mentioned underground facilities yeah, there. Tunnels. I think anything that throws confusion into the game, so decoys, tunnels, any kind of thing that uh, causes us to put more resources against the problem, um, which spreads us thinner and thinner, and if it's a denied environment, that's harder and harder for us to do. So they are, there's a lot of things that they can do to complicate our picture to be sure we found the right thing, as Bob was saying. And then the ability to, as I was saying earlier, hold custody of whatever we found over time with all the opportunities for them to throw in confusion. It, it, it's a very challenging problem. Mobility, yep. moving things around, shell games. Mm -hmm. And undersea. Um, yeah. And the only thing I would add is, I, I don't want to repeat myself, but the one of the big things they're doing are developing those a 2 ed capabilities to hold our current um, finders and finishers at risk, Fire and, that, and I think I think that people know what that what that encompasses. But it's a, it, that's a multifaceted problem. Well, but holding them at risk, but also pushing them pushing further them away, away, which so, means your strike so, asset takes longer to arrive. Right. So, potentially. so think about the number of so in terms of just the find um, um, potential adversaries or can jam, dazzle, or otherwise disrupt um, either permanently or, or, or temporarily our satellite constellation. And we have a limited number of satellites, and they know where they are, um, and they're developing the capabilities to do that. Um, and then we have, in terms of persistent ISR, airborne ISR, you know, the vast majority of our capacity is really designed for, not, for permissive environments. So they can just find them and shoot them down. You know, so what we need, moving forward, is a lot more long-range, penetrating, persistent surveillance. Um, and as several people, I think, have met, mentioned, if you can, you want hybrid platforms that can do, do both the penetrating surveillance and strike. Because if you're there, you find the target, yeah. you want to be able to shoot the target. You know, it, it just complicates everything if you have to bring in other shooters or launch missiles. If you can, if you can have this sufficient magazine depth, you want to do that. And we just don't have very much of that right now. But of course, the ability to, to find and finish with platform implies that you are in a situation where the rules of engagement and all have been established. Well, you to do you're that. talking about right, you're right. already in conflict. Then there's the very challenging situation of pre-conflict where you're trying to be ready to defend, but you don't have all of that. And there's some real policy issues there in terms of what we are willing to do to, to do this, this fix process in a denied environment pre-crisis um, to be prepared. That's a really, really good point. And I think, I just think that further emphasizes the importance of persistence, including in a non-permissive environment, so you can maintain that custody of a traffic target. Or thinking differently about space. Um, one of the things that's going on now is the commercialization and sort of prol proliferated small satellite constellations of LEO. And we'll see if that happens. But if it does happen, it could be potentially hundreds or thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit that would give you a very high revisit rate, almost like a stair, and give you persistence from space. Uh, we'll see if that happens or not, but that's the types of capabilities that we'd want to have in the future to maintain the custody of the target, as Christine was saying. 
Yeah, I, I, I'd actually like to stick with that point for a minute because I think it's very interesting. You know, we've been talking about uh, what the adversary can do to kind of drive a wedge between find and finish, but there are also internal decision-making processes in, within our own government that also widen the gap between and, when you found something and when you have the authority and, to strike. Yeah, don't underestimate that. I, even in a time where you have all of the assets in place, it was alluded to in the, in the last panel about some of the painstaking because you have this information, there's going to be a great tendency to want to draw it up to the levels where decision makers want to have that information. And then the next thing you know, you know, these are, these are tactical kinds of discussions sometimes that are being done in the sit room. Um, I mean, any thoughts about how that changes the way that we think about capabilities to ad address this problem? I mean, so, you know, you're kind of combining your find and your finish asset into a single platform that's persistent and survivable um, is interesting, but if the delay is the result of, you know, waiting on a decision. As long as it has endurance and persistence, it could, theoretically, it can hang out for a while. <laughs> the question is, if you don't have the survivability and you get shot down, well, that's a problem, right? Then, mm -hmm. But it, it depends how long we're talking about. If you're talking yeah. about hours or, you know, or, or less than days, Potentially, you could, you could have a long endurance penetrating airborne asset hang out over a target for a pretty extended period of time. We've done that. Um, but, but it's broader than that. I mean, this issue of persistence and survivability isn't just about aircraft. It's about UUVs. It's about submarines. It's about all kinds of other things. It could be uh, uh, troops on the ground. I'm just, it's just the idea of persistence and survivability is what you want. There are various ways you can achieve that. Mm -hmm. Christine touched on it, I think, in that a lot of this depends on what, what you're doing, what's the phase of operations. If you're in all-out conflict, then you've got one set of problems and you're more willing to go into either deliberate targeting or something that's a lot more predictive and, uh, and deliberate about how you're doing that. If you're not in hostilities, then that, those decisions are going to be driven way up because the tactical people are going to try to give their bosses the time to make those decisions. So a lot of this depends, is very dependent on what kind of operations you're doing. Absolutely. And you asked what does that mean in terms of the capabilities that might be required? I think that in that pre-hostilities but still kind of crisis situation, mm -hmm. the more information that's available to the decision makers, the more comfortable they are about giving the decision. So that's just this insatiable demand for information, for, in my opinion, at least understandable reasons pre-crisis, pre-conflict, rather. But if we are pre-conflict, can we really give you that persistence? Bob is talking a lot about the possibilities of space, which I absolutely agree with. But the information has to be analyzed, integrated, and made available quickly, crossing now, not just the defense and the intelligence communities, but the commercial world as well. And that's something we have always struggled with, and I think that that struggle needs to be addressed very early on. And just to build on that, I mean, to make all of this work, you really need the communications, you know, our command and control and communications infrastructure, which, depending if we're in peacetime or in crisis, which may also be under attack. Mm -hmm. uh, and then. Just imagine you have all these sensors out there, various kinds, collecting all this data, uh, fusing that data, analyzing that data, making sense of all that data. It, it's already overwhelming today. It's going to become more overwhelming over time. And that's why I think artificial intelligence is going to become increasingly central to providing that timely, accurate information to the decision makers that Christine was, was mentioning. Mm -hmm. So we, we started the conversation kind of focused on the finders and the strike asset, but there's a communication component that's critical and also a, a PED component or a processing uh, exploitation dissemination. <laughs> Took me a minute to come up with the acronym component here as well. Yeah. And I think that that part of it is particularly important when you have to fix for a long period of time. So all of that information is coming in and you're trying to keep custody of your target when they're trying to trick you mm -hmm. um, and you're trying to make sense of all that information and provide that information to decision makers. So mm -hmm. it's quite a challenging phase, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so to try to maybe get down one more level of specificity here, what kind of investments should the department be looking at 
to, to tackle this pr problem specifically or to eliminate or reduce the need to fix targets? We've talked about a couple things. wonder if there's anything else. Well, I think, you know, the targeting process is a very deliberate process. And it's, I think, from a, uh, a doctrine point of view, the ability to move fast, especially when you're talking about hypersonics or uh, the, you know, the speed in which, uh, with which uh, your opponent can either hit you or you've got the ability to hit him. So I think that um, the stuff that we can control right now Doctrinally, we should be thinking about how do we drive down the time for us to make these kinds of decisions with the full understanding that, you know, we put a JDAM into the Chinese embassy in 1999. It was, it, it was executed the way that the mission had been planned, and yet it was a gross miss. So there's going to be human frailty. This is an inherently human uh, endeavor. And so back to the Lowell, let's fail frequently. This is not something you want to fail at. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got to come up with a balance between the ability to adapt and move forward and innovate, but innovation means that you're going to have failures. And coming to, coming to grips with that is something that's going to be a challenge, I think. I, I think on the finder side, it's really about um, increased persistence and survivability uh, to do that, that finding mission and maintain uh, custody of, of, of targets. And on the uh, finishing side of the equation, it's um, magazine depth and uh, responsiveness and speed. And for each of the services, I think that there's a number of ramifications of what that means. You know, I think a big one is, you know, just looking at the Air Force and the Navy, is moving away from a dominance of manned short-range fighters and manned high-signature ISR platforms to longer-range, increasingly unmanned, stealthy penetrating but you can go down the whole list of the services in terms of their portfolio, but if you really believe finders need to be more survivable and persistent and, uh, and the finishers need to be have higher magazine and more survivable and more responsive, there's a lot of ramifications for the services. Cost, especially. Yeah, be, you need to make trades. I yeah. mean, this is not a, these are not uh, free goods that you just, something else is gonna have to be dialed down and you can dial up these types of capabilities. I would say it's uh, information sharing and analysis and dissemination. I, I think that that is an area where there's a lot of information. We're constantly building new systems to give us more information, but we don't invest enough in the understanding that the information could provide us. Mm -hmm. And Bob mentioned artificial intelligence earlier. I, I absolutely think that's a piece of it. But I am at the Applied Physics Lab, so I have to throw that cautionary note out there. I do hear AI thrown around all the time as magic. And um, I, I hear that as a cry for help. Whenever I hear <laughs> it, it's a solution, AI is going to solve it, it means we have a big problem. <laughs> AI is not magic, and it's not ready to solve this problem. But it could be if we worked hard on it. But we absolutely ought to hear the cry for magic because it's, it's desperately needed for the report. Let me put a, one caveat here at the end, and that, that is we've got to think beyond this is the only kind of environment we're going to face in that if you do this right, you take down the integrated defenses, and then you reach the point where you're able to close. Because if, so if you've only got a few capabilities, weapons-wise, or stealth, you know, to, to be able to penetrate this, it's going to be a really long war because you don't have enough mass to be able to create the effects to change the outcome. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is you roll these things back or you create sanctuaries that allow you to operate and then you go in and then generate more effects. So I think that there's a, if you only go with kind of the high end penetrating piece, then you don't ever create the, the mass that, that will create the effects that you want. So there's a balance there. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's not a bad segue, actually, to my final question, and then we'll throw it to the audience for their questions. And, and uh, my question is, what, what does this problem set mean in terms of jointness? Um, and does the evolution of adversary anti-access uh, area denial capabilities mean uh, 
you know, that we need to, we need, I mean, we always need more jointness, right? But if your finder is, belongs to the Air Force and your strike asset belongs to the Navy, for example, what, what does this mean for the problem set? So um, I'll start. I, I think that um, whenever you have tight timelines and so much at stake, it means that the jointness has to work like a well-oiled machine, even more so. Mm -hmm. You can't have those friction points that are just inherent in, in the services. But I actually think that in times where that's needed, the services work you get that out operationally. But this problem, I think, increasingly is going to cause um, a challenge in our agency. We're going to have mm -hmm. to be able to go seamlessly from intelligence information to tactical information and back again. That is a new kind of jointness challenge that we know of, we've worked on, but I think there's a lot more work that can be done. Mm -hmm. I fundamentally agree. I mean, I think uh, Christine Mailman, I don't have too much to add. I We've come a long way in terms of being able to share information in a, in a real-time tactical sense. Uh, there must not be any joint seams, in my opinion, in any future kit that we buy. It cannot, I can't have a system that only talks to itself and nobody else. Uh, I've got to have the ability to disseminate information in, in appropriate networks. So, you know, we've originally had this idea of the kill chain. It was an individual series of things that have to happen to be able to uh, successfully put ordnance on a target. And now we've gotten into kind of a web or a network so that there are a number of different ways that you can still accomplish that even if there are some breaks in that. And so I think that's where also conceptually we've got to be spending some time thinking about how to make this resilient because it, we will not be uncontested. Uh, in this, and so you build this beautiful thing that works in peacetime with clear air and no jamming, and then you're going to suddenly find that things don't work the way that you thought they should. So it's going to have to be really resilient and capable of uh, working way, you know, through a lot of uh, degradation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll open up to the audience. Are there microphones on both sides? Take first question right here. Thanks. Um, Jonathan Ward from I wanted to ask, when it comes to Russia and China, what is their understanding of the entire process of find, fix, and finish? I mean, what does this look like? You know, what's their problem set? How do they approach these problems? How do they understand? They've listened to us and they've watched us over a long time. And personal opinion, we, are, we the U.S. military, are way over-invested in the RF spectrum. Um, and so if you've got to admit to operate, then you're going to find that there are people who are going to take advantage of that. Uh, so in my opinion, it's driven them to, um, to think about ways to defeat our strengths and exploit um, the ways that we've operated. Uh, so we've got to now look at ourselves with a fresh eye and understand the fact that, in fact, the last 15 or 20 years have been pretty benign in terms of a threat, and we've got to take that into account. Right here. Not wanting to get too tactical, but a couple of important points have been raised about the need for better jointness and more networking. So when you look at what the Navy has done for many years and what Air Force is trying to do now, you know, Air Force is trying to do this sort of multi-domain command and control networking, and, and Navy has had sort of the integrated fire control networking system. But my observation is never the twain shall meet. How do we force ourselves to work across that important area collaboratively without just talking about it, but actually doing something that makes it more joint and makes it work in all domains? Could I, could I just ask that you let us know who you are and where you're from? Oh, I'm sorry. Bruce Grooms, uh, retired Navy, and now I work at the Raytheon. Well, that was a question that you and I chewed on at N3 and 5 a few years ago, isn't it? <laughs> um, we, we had come up with this idea of the air-sea battle and now trying to drive the U.S. military to a point where we're capable of uh, exchanging this kind of information. Um, unfortunately, our programs are not funded in a joint way. And so we've got to figure out a way as operators to make this stuff work when, in fact, 
I mean, you can just go down and look. Aegis versus Patriot. Those were, those were developed completely independent. E2 versus AWACS. Uh, you know, it, there's just a long list of things that each service created for its own use. And because their f service focus was satisfied by their procurement process, we found ourselves in places where um, there wasn't that kind of interoperability. I'd like to think that we can do better than that in the future. It, but this comes down to programmatics. If no, there's no incentive that I can think of where you're now, unless there's a way that you build it from the inside out so you can say, I want these things to interoperate. Uh, we've been doing all of this kind of on the fly stuff in the last 20 years of finding ways to have images pr presented to people in the airplane. It wasn't the system that created that. It was uh, the operators who were doing that. Um, so F-35, I think, is a catalyst for some of that, personally, because that's going to drive us towards a, a common platform that gives us more ability to share this information, at least among the F-35 uh, community. So I think I agree with that, and I think um, there are the bureaucratic, institutional, you know, service, culture impediments to everything you were talking about. But I think in this area, technology may help us in that um, you know, software-defined radios, for example, now will allow uh, us to more dynamically deal with the data link problem, right? So uh, you know, a lot of this comes down to protocols and standards and data links so that mm -hmm. we can share the requisite information. I think that there's a lot going on in that space now um, that I, I think technology may help with the, just the ability uh, to move the data. Whether or not we're willing to share the data or anything else is another question. But I think from a technical perspective, uh, the advent of um, software-defined radios is going to really change things. And I would just add that I think that we need to demand interoperability at the highest level. So when we're looking at the programs that are proposed by the services, we need to make sure that they meet interoperability standards now. That just sounds so simple. And I know it sounds so obvious, but it is so hard to do because the devil is so in the details. And if you don't understand that this bit setting in this case makes it so it all doesn't work. You, you can't do that drive, as you, I'm sure, appreciate. And people up at the top in OSD are going to know, they're not going to know to ask the right question. So it, it's a really big challenge, but we have to try to demand it. Are there incentives that can be created within the programming process? You know, to push, those, to push the decisions down to lower levels where they do know what questions to ask? about interoperability? I think that if we could identify and agree across the entire department on some basic interoperability requirements and standards, and then just always ask the question, do you meet them, you could do that. Mm. The trick is getting the standards written such that's, that that's when hard. you meet them, you have achieved success. That is that's hard. Very, very hard. But not impossible, and I think we should try. Okay. Over there. Thanks for being here. It's a great panel. Uh, Colonel Cam Cantlin, a U.S. Army uh, military fellow for CNAS. Uh, I wanted to kind of uh, go, although I love this last discussion, and I agree, it's incredibly hard, having sat through a few J-Rocks and trying to synchronize requirements across the services that uh, provides platforms that uh, work across all domains and services is incredibly hard. But I, I, I Ken say I haven't done that in the last couple of years in the, the five-sided building. Uh, we are working towards that. Um, but my question is more on the policy side. Um, and for you, uh, Honorable Fox, the uh, quick question on, do you see an evolution or, or a change in our current policy? Uh, or could you just discuss the current policy as you, as you would an analyze it on the application of ISR, uh, armed or unarmed, um, in uh, adversarial uh, non-declared nation states and, and how do you see this policy evolving as the uh, as we increase our capability uh, I'm not sure what capacity but at least our capabilities for those uh, unique qualified ISR and, and or strike platforms was this Admiral Fox or Christine Admiral, Fox did you say Admiral Fox right uh, actually uh, Christine Fox. Uh, okay. Uh, you were looking at her, and so that was why I was like, okay. <laughs> I'll, sure. I'll get my best shot, but she's the policy person. <laughs> oh, no, that's so, um, so I don't have a good answer for you. I think you're asking an ex 
excellent question that we need to soul search on. I do think that there are some of these time critical target categories where the question that you raise should force us to ask ourselves what are we willing to do and with what kinds of assets. And I think that that's starting to be realized, but I don't think it's solved. Um, and we, but we do have to start grappling with it. And I think a way to grapple with it is to, on a case-by-case -case basis, because as we all discussed, there's lots, and Bob said earlier, so many of these different kinds of challenges where you've got the find, fix, finish challenge. So figure out the set that are the most <coughs> concerning, that require those kinds of questions to be answered, and then do the what if. What if we don't do it? What if we do do it? How does it look? Policymakers, are you happy with that picture? If not, let's figure out what we can do about it. But it, it's a very thorny issue. And, and I think it's been a thorny issue for a long time. You know, so right. the issue of surveillance in uh, over other countries that we're not at war with, we've been dealing with for a long, long time. The U2, you know. So it really comes down to under what situ situations and what's your tolerance for risk. And honestly, that's going to vary from person to person, you know, administration to administration, what they're willing to do. Um, but, you know, we're gone from a world where, um, you know, first we only had manned surveillance, and then we got out of that business and went into space. And we said, well, there's problems with space, we can't do everything we need, so now we have penetrating airborne surveillance. And the good news is you don't have a pilot in there. So I think you may be less risk averse in, in some situations because you don't have that problem. But we've, we've been dealing with this problem, this policy question for beginning, since the beginning of the Cold War at least. Right here. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. I'd like to follow on Christine's uh, marvelous view of the Pentagon. Um, if you had a magic bullet and you could really alter the organization of the Pentagon <laughs> without constraint, no what would you do? And the second part of the question is, what could you possibly do that's feasible? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you always ask the easiest questions, Harlan. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> So if I had a magic bullet, what would I do with the Pentagon? I think that if I had a magic bullet, I would have a more lucid dialogue, an informed dialogue between requirements and acquisition that would allow us to make decisions more quickly with eyes open on consequences to go. I do think that that, that is a very, we, we've, had all kinds of conversations about why acquisition is slow and why we're lagging and blah, blah, blah. And there's lots of reasons. There's lots of good things about our process that builds things that last a long time that I personally don't want to throw out. So if we want to get quicker, we ought to have a better way of talking across the department about what do we need to do and let's do it. And so by the magic bullet, I'd make those conversations smooth, seamless, informed. It would just go wonderfully well. Okay, you add, you know, and then the second question is, what can we do? So that would be hard to do my magic bullet, but I do think that it's actually not as impossible as some things. I think that there's a growing recognition that those dialogues need to happen um, more regularly and with less of the process that controls them. So it's an off the top of the head answer to a very hard question. That's a hard question. I'd say, if I was going for a day, I would uh, blow up 5000.2 and start over in terms of the acquisition <laughs> yeah, process. Um, and the second thing I would do is try to create more inter-service competition. And I think this, Congress wouldn't like this, but I mean, one thing you can conceive of doing is giving the Secretary and the, the, maybe the Deputy a Bishop's Fund, a sizable Bishop's Fund, and then make the services compete for those funds to accomplish various tasks, whatever the President and the Secretary want to prioritize. Uh, but there has to be a way to make the services kind of work for it a little bit in terms of innovating, which right now they don't have to do. If I were king for a day, uh, you, you read the book, uh, I think it's Arsenal of Democracy or Freedom's Forge, one of those, you know, talks about the remarkable turnaround that American industry uh, created the arsenal of democracy in World War II, and it was a real run, near run thing. Um, we have allowed our acquisition process now to reach the point where it is long, slow, and cumbersome because it can be. We haven't had an existential threat. And so our system has devolved to the most inefficient and most costly way for us to find a way to buy our stuff. 
And so I, I think that we've got to, if I were king for a day, I would probably find a way to reduce the number of federal acquisition requirements and and move forward in something that you've got to you got to move out here. We cannot. No, well, it's whatever it is, uh, you know, it's it's the we've got to be faster, we've got to be more agile, and we've got to be able, you know, the airplanes in World War II were paper cups, and then in Korea they became plastic, and then in Vietnam they became glass, and now we're flying crystal, fine crystal, and so when we crash an airplane now, it's it's a piece of, we lost a piece of crystal. Uh, we've got to f figure out a way to go faster, better, cheaper with an acquisition uh, process that is dragging you, trying to pull you back from that. Going back to Christine made a comment earlier about how AI is, is, is really a, a cry for help, that if you have a big problem and AI is going to solve it. Um, I think you see the same thing with the acquisition process, with the proliferation of all these rapid, Air Force Rapid Capability Office, and now the Navy has MAKO, and everyone's coming up with a way to streamline the acquisition process around, the, you know, to work around it, because it's broken. The reason why all these things, all we have all these new models of streamlined acquisition is because the current one doesn't work. So I'm just going to pile on since we started with the, I would not <laughs> blow up 5,000 dollars I would um, absolutely supplement it though. I, I think that we should be very careful to, to lose sight of the fact that we still build very capable things that last a very long time and can be upgraded. And it's very difficult to do that through a two-month process, right? I mean, that just doesn't work. But we have to find a way to get those two-month processes into our system and to encourage them. And I also think, and this is more controversial perhaps, but as the CAPE director, I should be proud of the fact that there's lots of realistic independent cost estimates and no non McCurdy's today. And for those of you who know acquisition speak, that means our programs are on time and on budget. If you can perfectly predict the time and cost of a program at the beginning, that is not a very interesting program. That is not a very risky program. That is not going to move technology forward in an interesting way. And that is what is required by the Hill of the department today. Yep. So our programs are on time and on budget, and they're incremental. And our adversaries, they're not incrementalizing anything, they're jumping. And so we need to have an arrangement, I believe, with the Hill, such that we can accept more risk, not the way we used to, where we lied to ourselves about the schedule and the cost, but in a way that we do it with eyes open. This is important enough to take the risk that we don't know how long it's gonna take or how much it's gonna cost, and have a handful of those that we pursue. That, I think, is more critical, even even more critical, let me say, Bob, than blowing up $5,000. I mean, I do exaggerate, but I just think it has to be incredibly <laughs> streamlined. I mean, it's, I mean, every time it's been revised or, or tried to be updated, it just adds more and more processes and more and more steps, and it takes an already complex thing and just makes it more complex. Just look at the, look at the history, and I think, I remember Sean Stackley he used to carry around a couple cards in his, in his, in his pocket that showed the wiring diagram for the acquisition process and how it's evolved over time. And it goes from complex to more complex to crazy complex. And so maybe blowing it up isn't right, but I want to go back to the one like four index cards again. I think maybe one more question. We'll do two. So now you had your end up before. Hi, uh, Luke Zhenghua from South China Morning Post of Hong Kong. Uh, the U.S. and China have been cooperating on North Korean issues and also uh, risking conflicts in the South China Sea. So how uh, the two sides to manage these two hotspots? Uh, any option, practical options on the table through uh, military or diplomacy? Uh, are we going to face any military uh, conflicts, especially in the South China Sea between these two countries, especially when uh, John Bolton and Mike Pompeo is, will be at their new uh, uh, jobs? Thanks. This, this one is a little off topic, but any, anyone care to take a swing? <laughs> nations have an awful lot to talk about all the time uh, in this interconnected world and so we should just keep talking.
Uh, I, I guess I would highlight the fact, though, that our defense guidance has now come out from Secretary Mattis, and he is explicit about labeling uh, some of the competition that you just described. And so the best way to avoid conflict is to be really prepared for it, and that way we will never back into it. Um, and I think that that's, that's, you'll, that's the discussion I think you hear inside the Beltway now is how do we prevent bad things from happening. We want to continue to talk. Nobody wants to fight, but nobody wants to be run over either. And last question. Uh, I'll, use my, I'll use my command voice, non client health assistance. So we've talked a lot about the cost that potential adversaries are posing on us both in find and fix. We've spoken extremely briefly about anything that we can do to impose costs on the adversary. And this is not a new problem. We were doing the same thing that old works. It's kind of back to the future. Maybe orders of magnitude faster, but conceptually it's still the same. So what can we do to, again, compress our timeline and increase the adversaries? It's really, it's a, it's a two-edged sword. You can apply both your own processes and then a constant of denial of the adversary. I, I would say, you know, we are doing a, a series of things to make the finding challenge more difficult for prospective adversaries. And I would say one of the two areas where I think the United States has an enduring advantage in terms of finding is undersea warfare. Um, and we're doing more in that area with the UVs and other things, but preserving our submarine program. And the other is airborne stealth. And, you know, the B Air Force, the B-21, I think is a good example of that. So, and there's a host of other things, electronic warfare and cyber and decoys and such. We're doing a lot to make things harder for it so that our adversaries can't find us. I think one of the things we need to do more is um, move away from reliance on close in forward bases that are known and we can't really hide because our adversaries know that we're going to be operating from those bases. And so, uh, either more uh, agility in terms of basing, basing flexibility, or operating for more extended range. And then uh, in terms of preventing them from finishing, which I guess is the flip side for us, um, I think directed energy is, is, a, is really a big thing and short range point defenses. Both of those are things that the Army and the Marine Corps are getting into the point defense business and I think the Navy is really leading the way in terms of directed energy uh, as a way to prevent that finish. You're right, it's back to the future. I mean, MCON uh, doing things that aren't just going right downtown and uh, showing every showing off. So, and there are ways to do that. Uh, and for those of us who who did that in the Cold War, uh, it's a it's a good thing to brush off. And you can operate a ship or airplanes without emissions. Any last words? Okay. Uh, well, that's all the time we have for this panel. I want to thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jerry Hendricks, who directs the defense program at the Center for New American Security, uh, who will be uh, moderating our Finnish panel. Thanks. <laughs>
as the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. Mr. John Luddy at the end is the Vice President for National Security Policy at Aerospace Industries Association. He also has had extensive experience in government and in industry. Uh, he's also a Marine Infantry Officer and graduated from the Army's Airborne and Ranger Schools, uh, which makes him slightly odd. Um, but, uh, but we appreciate him being here today. And Dr. Mara Carlin is an Associate Professor of Practice of Strategic Studies at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and the Associate Director of the School Strategic Studies Program. She's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and previously she served in a multitude of roles in government, including as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Force Development. So it's my pleasure to welcome them here today as we have this conversation about the finished portion of the future force. So thank you, and please uh, join me in welcoming them. Okay, these are interesting modified chairs. All right, so for, for all three of you, for all three of you, so we've, we've already been through the finding section and, and uh, in the fixing section, the idea of then locating and holding uh, onto a target, specifically in sort of these advanced contested environments. Uh, but as we come into the finish section, I want to ask you, what is your general impression of the overall report and specifically the finishing the target section? Was it on target or off target in, in, based upon your experience and background from your time in, in, in service in government as well as your, your work in the industry uh, as, as well as in academia? Mr. Miller. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, pleasure to be here. And it's, a, it's an excellent report. And I'm particularly pleased to be here for an event that honors the member of Sean Lemon as well. I had the opportunity to work with him multiple times uh, in both the nonprofit sector and the government. Great man, great contribution, and a great loss to have him pass away. Uh, I, before I answer, uh, I'd like to also say that I'm speaking only for myself, not for the Defense Science Board, Department of Defense, or any other organizations. So I'd make four quick points. First is I think that the report really does cover the territory very well, and I think you know, uh, that's true for the, for the fix as well as for the other sections. And one of the important elements of it is things that it doesn't do or that the assertion of the made in the report highlight. And that is, for example, you can't wish away A2 AD. Uh, Russia, uh, China, and to a lesser but significant degree, Iran, North Korea, all have significant and growing A2 AD capabilities. Uh, you can't assume a silver bullet to knock down the A2 AD, right? So you've, and the report goes through the elements of that uh, uh, in a portfolio approach. Um, you can't assume that US, the U.S. can get away with only pinprick strikes against any of these adversaries. So you're talking about high volume precision strike capabilities, and it puts the bar pretty high, as we've seen even from the, the previous panels um, as you do that. And, and finally, as you think about what the context of the report, it uh, very clearly suggests that we should be focused on conventional capabilities while we need a nuclear deterrent, uh, that we don't want the only penetrating capability that we have as a nation to be nuclear. Uh, even with respect to the big players. So th those are all really important. Second, I think the, uh, good, the report does a very good job of laying out the, the elements of the approach. And the only thing I would say here is that um, on the follow-up work, I would very much encourage building on that. And as, as uh, someone like Christine Fox, who headed CAPE as well as being deputy, might have uh, suggested uh, overall, look at that portfolio and look at alternative options, strategy-driven options for building the portfolio, look at how that portfolio performs, uh, and recognize that we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars of additional investment, so we should be talking about disinvestment mm -hmm. as well. What are we not going to do, first within the broad portfolio and second elsewhere? Um, uh, third, I th and I'm, I'm, these are not a single project each, yeah. uh, or a single short paper. But I think it'll be interesting to marry this work with work on uh, US and allied partner A2AD, cap uh, A2AD capabilities. Our A2AD capabilities are, to say limited, is a, is a vast uh, understatement. And if you think we're going to go forward with deep strikes into Russia or China, and our homeland is going to be a sanctuary, uh, I think you're mistaken. So as you think about. Uh, the A2AD bubble uh, uh, and uh, where it is today and how it will extend in the, in the future, 
I think you need to think about, for example, Chinese hacking into the, some of the companies that support Transcom, the extension of other maritime capabilities and so on, really is part of their uh, A2AD capabilities. And so as we think about uh, uh, the, the finished part, uh, the, um, we shouldn't s succumb to the fallacy of the last move. They will have additional moves. We need to think through escalation. And finally, in, on that vein, um, as we think especially about Russia and China uh, and the capacity for deep strikes, which the U.S. does need, uh, and it needs to burnish that capability, we're going to be looking at uh, significant escalation dynamics and at the high end, the potential for nuclear exchange. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a game of high stakes, uh, and we'll need to think through those issues. I'm going to shamelessly flog uh, or a couple of reports that Richard Fontaine and I uh, just completed on this question on U.S.-Russia escalation dynamics and strategic stability. I think marrying that work with this work as it goes forward will be important. All right. Overall, terrific report. I found it uh, informative, interesting, and valuable. All right. Thank you. Mara? Uh, first of all, thanks so much for having me. Uh, to echo Jim's comments, it's a real honor to be uh, at a conference that is honoring our friend Sean. Um, so it's always smart to be on a panel when you go after a really smart former boss because they've already said a lot of the great things. So my first comment is I foot stomp Jim, Jim Miller. That is usually a, a smart approach I found. Uh, but let, let me offer three thoughts uh, as, to, as to how I thought about this report. Uh, number one, I think the diagnosis is spot on. I think it, it sort of the, the view of what this future security environment is going to look like makes a lot of sense. It's thoughtful and it's rigorous. Two other pieces, though, that are perhaps sticking points, perhaps areas where to expand research. Um, one is, it is interesting to me when I read this report how similarly it could be written coming out of Moscow or Beijing. And that scares me because it's actually really dangerous if we're all seeing the future similarly, right? It means that our double down, our big bets, et cetera, are actually all probably going to be very similar, which gets you to all these really interesting historic case studies where it becomes not an issue of who can innovate fastest, but who has sort of worked in the idea of routine innovation. So it's iterative over and over and over, as opposed to looking for the game changer. At the end of the day, I don't know that any of this will be game changing, not least because, as far as I can tell, Moscow and Beijing are making some very, very similar bets. Uh, and then my final point actually uh, would take a tiny bit of criticism from the report, which is it is very technologically focused. And I also think here it's important to look at both a US military competitive advantage and also a general kind of US way of war. And that really does come down to issues like organization. Right? That ends up being, again, if we go to historic case studies, the examples we see are not that various countries, one has a massive advantage in a certain technology and the others do not. Usually, the timelines there are not so different. It's who can organize, who can figure out and stress test and fail quickly in developing different concepts of operations. Right? How do they understand what a tank is early in the world wars? Well, they play with it a lot, right? And you see some countries that figure that out in a way that makes a ton of sense and others that do not. So the next report, I guess, to give a, a homework assignment should really focus then on what does this mean for how we're organized? All right, John. Thanks, Jerry. I want to thank you and the center for including me today. I have to say as a former Marine infantry officer who spends most of his time on acquisition policy now, it's nice to be talking about the pointy end again. So this should be, uh, should be uh, rewarding. Um, I want to echo the comments about the report. I think it's a very well-written and coherent report from start to finish. Uh, I think words matter. And a lot of what this is about uh, from the standpoint of, of advocacy, from the standpoint of whatever directions we go in, we have to tell a story. And this, is a, this was a good contribution, I think, to telling, to telling that story. Now, in terms of where the report's uh, really on target, I think that it does a good job of scoping out the trade-offs in the, in the laws of physics. Uh, in terms of speed, payload, range, and endurance. Those are all variables that we have to deal with as we consider any range of force options or, or technological investments. I think th that's very important. It, it, it touches on the moral <coughs> questions regarding autonomy. And I think that's really important. That's an important conversation that's underway in the, in the, in the, among the experts. But I think that's an important conversation that needs to be conducted at some point in the, in the, in the, in the more public sphere. Uh, it talks about the, and, and, and really illustrates the importance of doctrine. And I think I heard some other folks today talking about that in panels. Uh, that is just as important as what we get. 
you know, the way we decide to use it and the way we think about using it. I, you know, I'm mindful of the work that Strategic Capabilities Office has done in that regard, you know, and really kind of taking things that we have, but p perhaps considering new ways of stitching them together. And then I think the, the, the report uh, draw, draws out, you know, the, the inherent strength and vitality of the American system, both in terms of just the, the, the economic flexibility, the, the innovation that our system provides. I think that's a very important thing to, uh, to talk about, and I think the report uh, be, begins to get at some of that. In terms of some, some uh, other areas that I think need to be discussed more, um, one is the question of cost. Any, any way we go about this is going to be very expensive. And if you, if you survey the political landscape right now, clearly uh, we may be at the high water mark this year and next year in terms of defense resources for the foreseeable future. So that's a really big question that, that somehow has to play into this. And I think, again, goes back to telling the story. You know, we're not going to improve that if we don't convince the American people in some way about the relevance of what we're doing, the importance of what we're doing. We also need, to, in terms of cost, to get out of our own way. And again, I alluded to working on acquisition policy. We do an awful lot on that, but we're in our own way a great deal uh, in ways that not only make things expensive, but impair us uh, from an innovation standpoint. Uh, another area that could be, I think, uh, discussed more is the role of allies and partners. So we're talking about some really uh, interesting ways of stitching together capabilities and balancing our force. Uh, it's hard to imagine doing anything significant going forward without a significant, the significant role of allies and partners. How much can we count on them doing the kinds of things that will fit into whatever model that we construct in doing in, in, in some, of, some of these technolo technological advancements? So I think that's an area that we could work on more. Jared, well, can I jump in? Yeah, please. You would ask us to, to be comfortable responding. So if I might actually respond. Uh, I'm delighted you brought up the example of the Strategic Capabilities Office. I think it builds on this idea of how do we think about organization. And so why has SCO worked as an entity? And I would offer sort of four hypotheses why. Number one, it has its own money. Number two, it is an appendage to the system, right? It is not part of the normal structure. Number three, it is able to focus on discrete issues, right? There's not the, hey, there's an extra tasking. Let's go throw it over to SCO that anyone who's been in a bureaucracy generally gets. And number four, you can argue that SCO has been able to fail a lot easier than other parts of the department and other parts of the acquisition system, where an, uh, uh, trying something, it not working out, doesn't lead to a slew of congressional hearings, doesn't lead to a lot of folks having to march down to Capitol Hill. And so that ability has allowed, I think, SCO to come out with some real successes. Uh, but you'll note that all of that means what has worked has been orthogonal to how our system usually works. And as we speak, the department is reorganizing to some extent, mm -hmm. and some of that autonomy is at least in question. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Well, this is this is an excellent example uh, of, of actually how the advisory council operates when we're when we're sort of all convened, because there are no talking sticks in the room. Uh, it's a <laughs> it's a very open conversation that goes on, and and really. It's pretty amazing because of the robustness of the conversation back and forth between colleagues from industry, academia, as well as in government service, uh, former government service, to come and, and share their thoughts with us. So I, I appreciate that, that just that back and forth. Uh, my next question is, is, is actually for Mr. Miller, but again, if, if anyone else wants to chime in as well. Um, but I wanted to ask you, from your perspective uh, of service in, in government as well as, 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 you know, in various different levels, is it possible really to actively challenge A to AD competitors? Have we made the right investments that are going to allow us to operate inside uh, the A to AD bubbles going forward? Or is that areas where we really need to do a lot of work? Yes. No. <laughs> yes, we need to do it. Uh, it's not just, it's, it's going to be extremely difficult in differing to different levels and in differing ways. Uh, for the, if you think about Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. And I think it's, it's useful to, to really, uh, while you have to differenti differentiate between each of those countries, to think of the, the strategic relationship that we have with Iran and North Korea, where we are asserting uh, strategic dominance, if you will, military dominance. We don't accept that they have the capacity uh, to hit us with nuclear weapons. We don't accept Iran uh, pursuing them. We don't uh, accept North Korea's nuclear weapons. We built a missile defense system to deal with it. 
we want to assert dominance, and the only real question is what is cost effective uh, and what works to go after their systems. Uh, we're not worried about having too much that would tip us into instability vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. We want to go after their mobile missiles, the K-08, K-11, et cetera. Uh, with respect to Russia and China, it's a different calculus. It's different because of the nuclear relationship, and it's also different be because they have the capacity to strike back in a much greater way and in multiple domains. So as I think that we'll find that there are things uh, that we will, uh, that are important to do for all of those potential adversaries. There are some that we will wish to have in, uh, in limited amounts for one particular or two partic particular adversaries. Some capacities like short range uh, hypersonics, relatively shorter range uh, hypersonics, uh, might be incredibly valuable for uh, North Korea and Iran, but not so valuable vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China. But on the other hand, not a stability problem as a conventional trident modification would have been, for example, right? So I think thinking about a portfolio approach uh, and some tailored capabilities, a bundle that comes together and recognize we're talking about a campaign. It will require organizational change. Uh, it, will, uh, it will cost hundreds of billions of dollars over a period of, of, of years and decades. And there will be important failures, not just in the innovation and so forth, uh, on the each as as go I think has been able to to have uh, but we need to see whether they have a long term impact or not right mm -hmm. still that's a TBD mm -hmm. um, but it, it's 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 important to do because uh, we are not going to be given sanctuary particularly vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China we don't want the only approach that we have to get after them uh, to be nuclear we uh, those although cyber is uh, becoming a more significant capability it's not sufficient. Uh, so we want that strike capability, we want it for deterrence, and we want to think through the stability aspects of it as well for Russia and China, even as we think through the, uh, how to turn up the dial, especially in the near term, in my view, for North Korea. Mm -hmm. Mara, um, within the re in this section of the report, we spent a lot on some of the new technologies uh, that are out there. And in, in your role as a, as a DASD for, for strategy and force development, um, you know, a lot of what we think is important uh, within the report was the idea of building deeper magazines. So small diameter bonds, uh, directed energy, uh, hypersonics, um, uh, you know, electromagnetics and so on, something that actually can deepen the magazine on, on our platforms that we have in existence or that we might build. How, what is your sense of confidence on, on where we're at on, on sort of these deeper magazine technologies that we've been betting on for quite a while? Indeed, I think you're spot on to put it that way, Jerry. Um, I remember someone saying to me, hypersonics is the next, be next big thing and it always will be, uh, when we were thinking about how much money to put, put the, uh, in, into that, that section. And, and I think that that's really a question, right? Look, it makes sense to make these sort of investments as you have articulated and as I think the report does in a, in a number of different ways. We do, however, need some really consistent assessment. What's working, what's not. I mean, rail guns, I think, are a very clear example here in terms of what's actually feasible and, and what is not. Um, you know, the report does also talk a bit about artificial intelligence and lethal autonomy and, and those notions. And I might push that point a little bit. Uh, the, you know, one of the many great things about this report is it's a really nice baselining. Uh, for those who are starting to think, how might all these different technologies exist? You know, what are they? How do they exist in this ecosystem? What do I, what do, I do with them? This, is, this report is the baseline, right? It, it, is, it is the primer. And there is a desperate need for a primer. The US military today has not generally, on the whole, been thinking about this sort of conflict. I mean, Jim was discussing context. And he's spot on, right? The, the context for almost all of the US military has been 17 years of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. So there's a little bit of just kind of getting comfortable with different types of capabilities, figuring out where can those capabilities go. Uh, on this idea, though, just to drill down on, on lethal autonomy in particular, one thing I find a little bit worrisome is this notion of robotics and others is seen as a panacea in some ways. Uh, that's dangerous, right? There's probably no panacea capability, no, no doubt, but it's also interpreted quite differently by others. Are we talking the Terminator, as I like to joke, or R2-D2, right? Those are different conversations. You're going to picture capabilities differently in context. You will organize differently for those. And until you get a real baselining across a defense apparatus, you may not actually pursue capabilities that are useful. All right. 
I, I find that your, your point there about artificial uh, intelligence in, in the finishing section, uh, there seems to be a great deal of divergence on how comfortable we are with that in our public conversation. But, but I will tell you, as, as someone who spent you know, 26 years in the Navy, you know, we got real comfortable with that back in the 1970s with Aegis and also with, with things like our, uh, our, our uh, Vulcan Phalanx SeaWiz uh, system, which is really, we, we have a full auto mode, um, but it, it, it's only under those specialized conditions of heightened war that we seem to get real comfortable with it. But in this nether space, we, we seem to have a lot of questions. John, my, my question for you is, as a person sort of with an informed perspective uh, from the industry environment, uh, is it possible, uh, essentially, as you look at where industry is going and, and so on, for long-dwell aircraft uh, from an aviation background to exist in an A2AD environment? Can they, or is it an in-and-out type of uh, performance profile, or is it a go-in-and-dwell um, into A2AD? It's a, that's a binary question, and the best answer to a binary question is it depends. So. Uh, I think there's no question that at the moment at least, the kind of persistence that we need uh, in, in a theater, on a theater basis, is probably best going to be best delivered by, persi by persistent, long endurance, uh, either manned or unmanned systems. Um, but you make a trade-off there. You make a trade-off, obviously, as I alluded to, the laws of physics that the report talks about. Uh, you make a trade-off in terms of endurance. You make a trade-off with speed. You make a trade-off in terms of payload. So you know, I, I think we have to develop a capability to do that kind of, to do that kind of, uh, uh, have that kind of platform, have that kind of system. But uh, over time, uh, it, it's really going to depend on what the, what the environment is like. So I, I'm thinking here about uh, CNO Richardson has recently talked about moving away from the A2AD AD label as a, as a catch-all for the kind of problem that we're talking about, it's because theaters are different. So probably in some theaters that will work, and in other theaters it won't. I'm hoping that the high school prom that's getting kicked off in the next room apparently. <laughs> They're having more fun than we are, no question jamming, about it. Uh, when we get the deputy secretary out here, so I think someone's going to go and have that. We're going to open the, the, the floor to questions right now. So again, if you can go ahead and raise your hand, and I will recognize and uh, attempt to go both sides here. So uh, Captain Oldman. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. Thank you, panel. Uh, my question has to do with defining winning victory and success. Uh, during the Cold War, we defined that largely by containing and deterring until the Soviet Union went pop and China crossed over to becoming a semi-capitalistic country. But today, how would you define in the 21st century notions of victory, winning, and success when the spectrum now expands to what the Russians call active measures but the individual who someday might take down the stock exchange with uh, some kind of cyber attack. Do we need to redefine these uh, notions as we also looking at the various strategies and force capabilities that we may have to procure in the future? So I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a first cut and give two quick answers to that. First part is, um, uh, yes, we need to think through what victory success and what do you mean? Uh, and it's different for each of these countries, and it will have different contexts. But at the same time, that uh, irrespective of the answer, uh, it's difficult for me to envision an answer that says, I don't want any non-nuclear strike capabilities uh, against this country in substantial quantity, right? I want, so in other words, we're, in a, we're, we're, we're stuck with MAD for the indefinite future with, with Russia and its emerging vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, uh, we, uh, the idea that we would have only nuclear capacity to strike to, at their homeland, uh, in nuclear and a bit of cyber, is, is unsatisfactory. So I think you can do this work uh, on the premise that you want the ability to hold at risk a substantial non number of critical targets in the context of a very strong A2 AD adversary without having to answer your, your question. doesn't mean your question is not fundamental. Uh, part two, as you look at it, again, uh, it's not just, as your question implies, it's not just uh, how you think about that, but how you think about deterrence, escalation, uh, and war termination. And I think uh, I know you've written on these topics, and so I, I won't, you know, we won't, won't go back over uh, each of the issues with you. Uh, absolutely, we need to think that through. And uh, 
it, in, on the day when a president of the United States employs these weapons, 10 years, 20 years down the road, the B-21 with small diameter bombs or the, or the next a, a significant offensive directed energy system or whatever it may be against uh, a Russia or China in particular, um, one shouldn't think that they'll say, oh, man, uh, that's it. Uh, we, have no, we have nothing to do in response to that. We really need to think through these escalation dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we think in particular about uh, cyber and outer space, the incentives to go early and heavy in a, you can call it crisis early conflict, yeah. are going to be incredibly strong. And so uh, we need to work them through. We need to work with our, and then have conversations with our allies and partners, and then have conversations with the Russians and Chinese. We, on also, these topics. Uh, we also, though, I would just add, want to be pretty rigorous in how we've thought about winning historically. I mean, careful of the lies we tell ourselves, right? Yes, the United States won the Cold War. That was not preordained, right? It happened for a whole bunch of reasons, a multitude of reasons, and there have been various stories. No, it was this that was the game changer. It was this game changer. It's pretty clear it was complicated. Mm -hmm. It turned out the right way. It also turned out the right way at a pretty decent sized cost. Right? We plan on a hot war with the Soviet Union. We lose 58,000 Americans in an insurgency in Vietnam. Right? Not exactly how you think about it. I note that not least because what I at least have always found profoundly worrisome, and you may have also perhaps, Jim, is how often the dialogue in the Pentagon is focused on the Persian Gulf War as the case study. That's victory, and we should try to do that again. Well, yes, if victory is going after a third-rate army over whom we have actually like quite minimal objectives to achieve, Sure, that's it. In no way should that be our paradigm, nor arguably should the Iraq and Afghan wars be our paradigms for what conflict with China and Russia will look like. I think the key change right now in, in the transition of the President's and the Secretary's national security, national defense strategy is the concept of scale. As we start talking about potential conflicts with two major near-peer competitors, China and Russia, we're talking about needing a lot of stuff and possibly losing a lot of stuff and having to replace a lot of stuff. And I don't think our, I mean, clearly that, that has to be understood at, at, at some level in the development of the strategy, yeah. but I don't hear it as a common theme in the dialogue in, in, the, in, the, in the military industrial complex, in the political world or anything, but that, the, 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 the scope and scale of what we're talking about having to do is, is a, a different thing from what we've been used to. When to his credit, oh, no, please. No, I just, I just would footstop something that, that you mentioned, that is that we need to do better in the gray zone. Absolutely. Um, we need to do a lot better, and as you, you can, we're making big investments in nuclear, we're making big investments, and we should in conventional. Mm. We are underinvested in competing in the gray zone, and we need to work that through. Mm. Uh, deploying, uh, 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 Torian Newland is one of our, one of our, has been one of our greatest historic assets. Uh, in that regard, we need to we need to build that arsenal out. We I mean, we make a Tory Newland robot, maybe that would work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but it, um, you know to build to build on your comment, to his credit, Secretary of Defense Mattis's national defense strategy, you can tell is infused with this idea of accepting more risk, right, and acknowledging, frankly, that we've kind of forgotten what big wars look like, and big wars will suffer yeah. uh, at a minimum from severe heartburn, mm. potentially from heart attack, and that's what we need to worry about. So I'll just finish out this with, with one thing, because going back to John's statement there about you know, our, our ability to ramp up, um, one of the, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge student of, of, of Eisenhower and specifically Solarium Project. You know, I, I spend a lot of time going back to that and, and doing a deep read of all three of the team's review. There's a huge amount of, of time spent within each team on, <clears throat> on the defense industrial base and the national security mm. infrastructure with a full view towards losing a large portion of it in a nuclear exchange. And so the idea of if I can't build aircraft carriers in New England, where am I going to build uh, our, our, our aircraft manufacturer? And, and I, I'm encouraged that we're actually having a defense industrial based conversation today. I'm uncomfortable with the level of risk that we're willing to take within it. Uh, I think that there's a need for much more capacity and redundancy within it. But okay. next question Absolutely. here to the young, the young guy. Thank you, Jonathan Ward with Atlas. Um, let's see, so I wanted to ask um, Dr. Miller, um, because you're bringing up um, escalation and deterrence and all of that, this is something I've been thinking a lot about recently as well, but curious about your views. Um, what does this mean if you introduce another dynamic, which is really China's expanding strategic geography? I mean, it's one thing to be thinking about um, the East China Sea and South China Sea, we're not, which were not exactly part of their strategic geography even in recent decades until now, but it's also moving into different regions, and in particular the Indian Ocean region. Um, so, so what does it mean to be dealing with deterrence escalation, the chances of the highest 
rungs of that ladder, etc. When you have a country that's fundamentally whose influence, economic, military, and otherwise, is expanding into the world. Yeah, um, it's a good question. Did, um, so let me start from a, a fundamental premise, and that is we've talked about China as a rising great power in the international system. China is a great power today, and it's a rising great power. Right? Those are those are. It's important to understand both elements of that. Their 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 military. Uh, uh, is growing at a, a substantial rate. Uh, even with our with our our boost over the last couple of years, uh, uh, we're not going to have a sustained growth uh, of the military to the same degree they have. And they are uh, under Xi Jinping have increasingly begun acting as great power, and to some degree as great powers historically have in asserting not just themselves in the economic fora and so forth internationally, uh, but to, in the South China Sea and elsewhere. Uh, uh, to use military intimidation and, and quasi or paramilitary tools as well. So the uh, escalation uh, is going to, it's, uh, it's likely to come out of, uh, out of a contest that could be in the South China Sea, it could be over Taiwan, it could be, it could be in varying areas geographically, uh, but it's got to be in the context of this broader competition. And we need to think through the space that China will occupy in the international system. And the idea that we stand back and watch is unsatisfactory. Uh, and it means pushing back. Uh, and I, I was, to, to be honest, I was surprised at how well the, the Obama administration uh, pushed back on theft of intellectual property worked. Uh, we need to be pushing back elsewhere, and similarly for, with respect to Russia on its cyber intrusions. Uh, pushing back meaning increasing the cost associated with that. Uh, because, and I'll conclude here, because the one thing we don't want, or one of the things we certainly don't want, is a situation in which our potential adversaries decide that they have a lot of running room. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and they just keep raising, they keep raising the bar, raising the bar, until finally uh, a president or the next president responds. Uh, it surprises them, and then we have uh, a unnecessary escalation that could happen very rapidly and lead to uh, significant war. You know, Jim's bringing up a, an interesting point on the econ side, and it, it helps for us to get out of our little defense bubble just for a minute. The one sentence that worried me the very most in this entire report says, America is home to many of the world's most innovative companies and minds. That has been historically a comparative advantage, not just competitive one, of America. To the extent that is no longer the case, others will fill that gap, and it's probably not going to the be the people that we want to be competing against us. Captain Howard. Uh, Reggie Howard, Captain Retired, uh, <laughs> BA Systems currently. Uh, quick question for you just on listening throughout the day so far. Um, a lot of what I hear for us to get where we need to go is a philosophical change on how we do business. Like you just talked about SCO and the fact that, that, that mm. what the, the successes they've had have been kind of outside the system. Uh, the system's not changing anytime soon. Uh, but it's going to take champions and leaders who kind of have that philosophy of thought. It's going to give us the flexibility of thought to take advantage of these technological mm -hmm. changes and to keep us on the leading edge. So from your vantage points, do you see that as a movement that's happening? Do you see those champions coming? Do you see that mentality getting into how we do business? Or are we going to be investing our money in systems that aren't what we need to take advantage of future scenarios? So, Reggie, I think that there's a couple of causes for optimism. One, one will be speaking here shortly. Uh, I'm being a little bit facetious, but the, there's leadership in the administration now uh, in the Defense Department that I think really recognizes the need to make some changes to how we go about thinking about what we get. Uh, Secretary Mattis, certainly Deputy Secretary Shanahan, all the service secretaries are, doing, are undertaking some meaningful initiatives in terms of cultivating innovation and improving our acquisition system. Um, but I definitely think that it's the kind of thing where we need to keep up the pressure. We've tried to do a lot at AIA in providing specific recommendations for how to do that. Um, going back to the administration, the, the industrial base assessment that's underway, again, it, it has a way of shining a light on this, on our industrial base and things that are important to us. Uh, uh, that's a good thing. And hopefully we'll, there will be a receptive audience on the Hill in the form of the chairman of the Armed Services Committees, both of whom had a fair, fair amount of uh, in, involvement in, in spurring the, the industrial base assessment. So I continue to be optimistic. It's always one step up and three quarters of a step back at least. 
Uh, but I think maybe as some of these larger pieces of discussion take place and we tell the story better to the American people, we get some more momentum behind it. I'll just be the skunk of the garden party. <laughs> Uh, so I like your, you know, step forward, three, four steps back. Uh, two points. One, when the U.S. was heavily involved in Iraq and Afghanistan, DARPA was very was able to very rapidly field immature technologies. Right? People are out there. People are dying. There's a real push. Get something ready so it can be used in the field, even if it's not kind of a hundred percent. Now that the U.S. deployments overseas obviously have gone down in that regard, there is going to be m much fewer opportunities for that. Second point. It is impossible to be a general officer or a flag officer right now in the U.S. military and not have largely cut your teeth on Iraq and Afghanistan. Very different types of conflicts, very different types of ways of thinking about the sorts of technologies you need, et cetera. And so in many ways, you're talking about a generational change that will be led by those that are not of that next generation. Let me, let me offer a, a perspective that is not exactly between the two, but just a, a little bit of additional thought. Um, during the 90s in particular, uh, while it wasn't the end of history, um, the Department of Defense undertook an effort uh, pursuing the so-called revolution of military affairs and, and, you know, and so-called transformation and so on. It was very, it was all blue. It was all, it wasn't just blue sky. It was all about what U.S. forces can do and assumptions about information superiority and, and, and et cetera, et cetera, as if the adversary had no vote and as, as if we would not have significant adversaries who, who could and would adapt. So. Um, the test for me will be, do we have, uh, do we, as we work through the prototype system, which I think we've only had a prototype of a prototyping system so far, we've got to push that out yeah. further. Uh, as we begin to uh, attempt to innovate and to, and to introduce these not, uh, new concepts and technologies into the force and as, within the services in the joint arena as well, um, the combination of our experience in the 90s and the failure of Joint Forces Command to develop effective concepts of operation that were innovative and, and useful. Uh, should 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 give us a bit of pause, uh, and it means to me it means uh, active red teaming and involving our allies and partners as well to get those additional perspectives uh, to make sure we don't just have the sound of of the blue hand clapping, if you will. So it's a general reminder of of, of days past when uh, during the Cold War when we would actually actively do this with an anticipation of, of real combat and real conflict between the two countries. Well, rather than take a, one additional question and then risk kind of going over, we want to go ahead and, and finish up. So please join me in thanking our panel members uh, for this finish panel. And, and we will now make room for the Deputy Secretary. Let's go that way. All right. Okay, you want to jump off the front? Yeah, I guess okay. so. It's all right. I'm a little shorter than Jeff. <laughs> You're also far more agile. <laughs> it's a question. Right, lethal, agile, and my own national defense strategy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That nice was cap. fun. That was Thank great. You yeah, you're far too kind. I, I don't deserve it at all. Uh, no, 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 no. I was like, I kept sort of making X's. Like, Am I important? <laughs> well, Jim made that really well. All right. I am Shanahan, our Deputy Secretary of Defense. Uh, Secretary Shanahan took up his current position in July of 2017. Uh, as you all probably know, he spent, built his career at Boeing. I personally appreciate somebody who spent 30 years in a single organization. He uh, worked on virtually any, everything and anything you've ever flown at Boeing, from the 727 to the 787, uh, Apache, Chinook, Osprey, missile defense systems. And he is now at the department, uh, the man in charge of reform, the man in charge of uh, bringing best practices from business to the government, and therefore the perfect person to address these change issues today. Thank you very much, Deputy Secretary Shannon. Join me in welcome. So I'm the person that stands between you and the bar. Is that is that the billing here? So, uh, hi, Steve Aubin. How are you? Good. It's uh, it's fun to, fun to be here in this room. I've never been to a think tank event, so uh, you know it's the first for everything. So, right? No, exactly. This is kind of a, a kickoff. So, do we have any Vietnam veterans here in the room? We got one here. I saw Alan earlier, and I thanked him for his service. Today is uh, recognition day for all uh, Vietnam veterans. The uh, so first of all, uh, just a big thank you for letting me uh, get out of the Pentagon. I spend uh, quite a bit of time there. I think uh, since. 
since July 19th, that puts me at about eight, eight months, and I think most of the weekends I've, I've spent there. Um, I like it there. This is like one of the best jobs I've ever had. So I, I thought working at Boeing was the best ever. Um, you know, getting up and beating Airbus every day, and uh, it's just a, we have this friendly rivalry. But uh, it's a wonderful industry, you have wonderful people, and I thought uh, it is probably you know the best best place ever to work. And then I discovered the Pentagon, and uh, you know with the, with the greatest sincerity, it is really uh, the best job I've ever had. The uh, you know, just just reflecting back on the on the past eight months, and it's gone by by pretty quickly. The way I calibrate some of that is when it comes to uh, you know having a really strong team. And I've been on a lot of really uh, strong teams, one of the best teams I've ever been on. And it's a real pleasure to, to serve and work for Secretary Mattis. I'd also say one of the things that has surprised me there is the amount of cohesion. I mean, people, uh, it is a very respectful environment. People trust each other quite a bit. And uh, the amazing thing is you hear so much about like uh, the bureaucracy and how slow things are, but you know, over the fall, while we were developing the national defense strategy and working on the budget, we did, uh, I think, uh, three hurricanes, uh, North Korea, Syria, Afghanistan. We kind of walked down the list, and it's uh, a very dynamic environment. And in the midst of all of that, people remained extraordinarily focused. <clears throat> I appreciate the comment on the, on the resume. When I think about uh, my role there at the, uh, at the Pentagon, it ties into, I think, what you've been talking about today. Most of my experience has been introducing change at scale. And the nice thing about working in a, uh, a, a business where it's complex engineered products that can't fail, and Boeing is the largest manufacturing export in the United States, you're used to working at scale and working fast. So, you know, coming to the Pentagon, it feels like the kind of the background in terms of business reforms engineering, technology development, uh, getting cost out of things that are, you know, in production. It's the, the background and the experiences. I feel uh, well suited to doing that. Which leads to me to my opening comment, which is I think I'm at the wrong event. Because this, I, it was uh, how do we evolve the future force? And I'm part of the department that gets stuff done. I was going to use another word, but we're really about getting stuff done. So I think when it comes to evolution, we're going to change that word to, to revolution. And I'll talk uh, for a few minutes about some, some thoughts there. But what I thought I'd do is maybe uh, take you inside uh, the locker room, if you will, like what have we, what have we been doing? Uh, where, where are we focused right now? So if you think about the national defense strategy, and that's really the I'll do a test here. How many of you have read the National Defense Strategy? Good, good. I have a $20 bill. If someone here can tell me what Secretary Mattis's three lines of effort are. Two out of three. Anybody else? You want to pass that gentleman? <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, no. The, uh, uh, the secretary made us all get tattoos so that we would, would, we would, we would never forget. The, uh, the, the thing that we've been doing, and the reason I, I start out with Get Stuff Done, is that we rolled the strategy out in January, and that's behind us. Uh, February was deliver a, a budget over to OMB, and we did that. Uh, March has really been about, okay, what are we doing to execute? So it's really about execution. I think that's been the theme of today. It's many of these issues, problems, ideas, solutions have been either uh, around for a while or they're emerging and we need to embrace them in a very risk-balanced way. So if you asked me, what we're doing in the month of, of March and where our priorities are, they're in, in three areas. No kidding, move the needle on readiness. We expect a year from now that Congress will ask us for a receipt on the money. We said we needed money for readiness. We, we want a receipt and see that all the things you said you needed 
in order to improve the readiness of the force, you were able to do. Uh, pretty straightforward, but we're very down and in. And if we had more time, I could kind of walk you to, you know, where that is. I'm not concerned about spending the money that we have in the period of time, you know, the balance of the six months. Story for another day, but that's how focused we are in making sure that we're not just spending the money, but spending it on the right thing so we move that needle. The second area is in uh, de-risking our programs of record. So when I say de-risking it, it means just make sure that you know we execute flawlessly. And the reason why that's so important is one, we want to complete those, and we want to deliver either ahead of schedule or under budget. But the most important thing is we don't want it to impact modernization. Our real focus is how do we accelerate modernization? And probably you know <clears throat> as you work through today, here it's all those really good ideas. You know, the modernization is how do you get those good ideas to scale? And so those are the kind of three um, major efforts when we talk programmatics. Then there's this big effort ongoing concurrently, which is reform. And in another forum, um, we can talk about that. It is not as sexy as evolving the future force. It is how we're going to pay to evolve the future force. And I think it'll be a down payment on the things that we can do uh, going forward. A lot of opportunity when it comes to reform. I'm going to do two uh, non sequiturs because this came up. Uh, I had uh, a few folks monitoring the meeting. It's really great. In the Department of Defense, you can monitor all sorts of things. So we had uh, people monitoring the meeting today. And comment came up, you know, we sure wish the department would, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, take some real risk on artificial intelligence. You know, when, when, when are we going to kind of speed things up there? Was that your question, Tony, or comment? OK, all right, good. The uh, thing I would share, share with this group, and it's a little bit why uh, um, folks like Mike Griffin, who's a, a specialist in space, who's going to help us on hypersonics, we, uh, we recruited this gentleman by the name of Dana DC, who was the CIO at J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. He retired in November, and he was going to have this really great retirement and spend all sorts of time uh, with his wife and go to the summer home that he's never used. And he managed 43,000 IT professionals and put cybersecurity and a whole host of other really advanced technologies from a computing standpoint in place. And he'll be joining us the first part of May. So when we talk about uh, risk. I think our risk tolerance is going to go higher, but I think it's not because we're going to take on things that are riskier. I think we're going to have people who've managed risk and demonstrated at scale how to deal with risk. So I'm pretty excited about what we're going to do at the Department of Defense when it comes to IT modernization, what we're going to do in terms of business intelligence, in terms of just intelligence. So, uh, you know, and again, on this non sequitur, you can imagine those of you who have worked in uh, really big companies, when you read that there are 500 and some cloud projects going on in the 15th largest economy in the world, that's not a surprise. The fact that we're going to get our arms around it, that will happen. In something that's as large as the 15th largest economy in the world, it doesn't happen overnight. So, um, hurting things up, uh, we're attracting more and more people to, to join the team. The other one, and uh, Alan, this came about uh, when we were in the other room. And when uh, most of us grew up, all great ideas came out of the Department of Defense. And on the commercial side, you leveraged uh, the technology. And we, we clearly recognize in the Department of Defense there are great ideas in the commercial world. And the commercial world, world is investing cons considerably more amounts of money in terms of R&D. So our version of R&D is to rip off and deploy. So it is that simple. OK, so um, you know, the mindset has always been, we'll, we'll, we'll grow it ourselves. It'll be organic. I think what you'll see with the team that's in place is there's a lot more, how do we leverage things that have already been done? And then it also gives us a chance to bring uh, new companies, new ideas, and expand the people that we work with in the Department of Defense. I'd say uh, kind of if we go back and, and talk a little bit about the, the National Defense Strategy and, and why it's very important to all of us is 
when you think about an organization as large as the Defense Department, it's how do you move quickly in the same direction and evolve at scale. That, that, that's really the major thinking around the National Defense Strategy. It isn't the things that we're going to do and the priorities that are being set are extremely important. It's the fact that we're all going to work to it. It is the lubrication that allows us to evolve more quickly. When you don't have a common lexicon, when you don't have a common understanding of the priorities, when you don't work to a, a set of goals and targets, then you go slow. And then the bureaucracy has to be utilized so you can make sure that people don't get out ahead of the, the wrong groups and all of a sudden structure and org charts have a lot of importance. That's what the national defense strategy allows us to dismantle. The other thing about the, uh, the national defense strategy is in, uh, in some ways, and this is, this is my own translation of it, it is the manifestation of a number of years of the NDAA. So when uh, Congress, you know, we talk about, when I was going through the confirmation process, which is something, if any of you have a chance to go through, I highly recommend it. It's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. Um, the, uh, you know, the Congress was, was quite clear, you're not working with us closely enough. And part of what we did in the, in the national defense strategy was really look at those major muscle movements, whether it was how ATNL was organized, what do we think about affordability, all of those things you'll see really are integrated into the NDS. Now, when, when 1,700 pages of NDA uh, a language gets sent over, we're not going to put all 1,700 pages in there, but the essence of many of the reforms and the changes, whether they're programmatic or in terms of affordability, those are reflected in the uh, NDS. And while I'm on the subject of, co of Congress, a uh, huge thanks goes out to Congress. I mean, you think about six months ago, if, you know, inside the building people were saying lifting the BCA caps would be extraordinarily difficult. I mean, I, being new, I had no idea how big these lifts were, but it, pretty much the consensus was it won't happen. And if it does happen, we won't get the money we need in order to really start working on modernization. And it happened. That's why now the big emphasis is on, okay, show us that you're gonna produce results and also show us that there's real accountability for achieving those results. And when you talk execution, we really talk results and, and accountability. There's a, an element here that I would throw out because I'm new to, to the think tank um, uh, circuit here where we could use help from the people that really kind of work in this uh, in this part of, of Washington, D.C. When I think of uh, the help that can be provided, I'll give you an example. Uh, it, it's, one, it's one of many, and, I, and maybe at some other time I can get invited back and, and share the, the laundry list, but it won't surprise you. It surprised me, but it won't surprise you that have, have worked here. The Pentagon's never been audited. I was like, the 15th largest economy in the world hasn't been audited? That's curious. Um, the, the, the work and the help that we need is the thinking that goes around, well, now that you've completed the audit, here's how you should focus on using the results most effectively. So if we said we wanted to evolve in the future, you know, the big brain trust would say, that's really interesting. Now that you have properly accounted for the Air Force Academy, let it go. These are the areas where having cost visibility, data accuracy, can give you real leverage either in saving costs or making better decisions. Here's how you should organize to do, you know, business intelligence or big data analytics. And I could use a lot of that help and, and I, I read a lot of the, the work that's produced by um, this body and some, some focused uh, recommendations and, and quite frankly, debates, you know, these kinds of forums would go a long ways in, in helping, uh, helping us leverage off of this significant effort. My, my goal, do you guys know David Norquist? So David, it's interesting, he has this title, it's called Comptroller. And uh, so we sat down and you know, you do this normal thing in, in industry where you like agree on results and outcome and performance. So his, his assignment is we're gonna take Comptroller off his business card and we're gonna make him the CFO. 
because we're less interested in how well he expends the money. We want him to be focused on what are we getting for it. So a lot of this, since we're going to do the audit, since we're going to move to the cloud and harmonize our financial management systems across DOD, we need somebody who can hold, like every place else, the people that spend the money accountable for the results. But I'm pretty excited. David's uh, jacked up about getting a new job title, and I'm, uh, I'm pretty encouraged about how that'll shake out. Maybe just because uh, <clears throat> there's uh, some real uh, uh, good industry partners here, it's, I w it's, it's fun being on the other side of the, the equation now because we can dispense with things that are um, impediments. There's a lot, a lot of things. I mean, I could, you know, I'll just run out of time uh, over the depending on working on, on acquisition reform. I mean, what we have to do is get output and where you know, we're working on things really tailor uh, fixes. But I would, you know, and looking back at Mike Petters, I've been thinking quite a bit about you know all the things we have to do. There's this concurrency of of work, and so there's like this impedance mis mismatch right now because we're you have this like incredible industrial base and we've got our signals off you know and, and they're not off in a bad way but it's like the feedback loops you know i look at what people want to do on readiness or you know i had i spent a uh, um, great day down at newport news and we were going through you know how do we take the tools and the investments that are being made in the shipbuilding industry and scale them up and how do we leverage some of the productivity gains and thinking that have occurred in automotive and aerospace and inject them into the, into the shipbuilding business? And we're not getting enough time with our industrial partners or the industrial base to really get after those things that quite frankly take changes on the behalf of the government to unlock the, the trapped productivity in the industrial base or to find some way to share the risk because it can't be a trap in terms of risk. Since uh, I know the uh, bar is open now, I thought uh, maybe I would close by, it's really great to be in Washington, D.C. Um, folks in the Department of Defense, uh, we're gonna get stuff done. So we'll probably, you know, you'll see a few of us with you know, T-shirts or buttons or coins that say GSD. Um, some of them might say GSDN, which means now and uh, look forward to uh, coming back and uh, addressing you earlier in the day on, with a little bit more time. So thank you very much.